So, after crying just a little bit after looking at crime scenes on the internet, I think it might be time to tell this story. It's just one of those moments where I randomly start thinking about it in a more serious mood than usual. This happened about six months ago now, maybe a bit more, but I don't really know for sure. Anyway, I was going home from university classes. I usually take the keys with me, but around that time I'd lost them. My mom was yet to get me a new copy. I remember I kept insisting, but she wouldn't listen. So what I did was knock on the door to get my younger brother's attention, so he'd come and let me in. But my mom also took his keys and just left him there locked up as well. I asked my brother to pass my charger from my room and I called one of my aunties to see if I could hang out at her workplace in the meantime. She said yes and then told me to call an Uber that she'd be paying for as soon as I got there. And that's what I did. Now, the Uber didn't pick me up exactly at home. It was at the house across the street instead. No special reason, it just did. The moment I saw the guy, he gave me a kind of a weird vibe. But I also tend to be paranoid every time I so much as hop in a taxi. So I got in, rolled down the window, and kept a grip on both of my phones. It all seemed relatively normal until we got to the area where my aunt's workplace was. The guy just completely drives past it and claimed he was following the GPS when I asked him about it. He wouldn't let me see said GPS. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. Now, I was kind of doomed from the beginning. I don't know the directions, and I could only rely on the driver being a decent person and recognizing the area. That's what I did. But wherever he was taking me, I had no idea. I remember seeing this fountain that I could recognize from when my mom drove to my uncle's place but that was way farther away from my aunt's place. By now, I was kind of thinking of what to do, because this guy drove past a fuck ton of empty housings. A couple of them seemed to be still under construction. Then he stopped near a place that looked like the end of civilization. We were literally on a hill. And then he turned off the car. I got lucky, in so many ways, looking back on it. My phone had no credit. As soon as I thought of that, my aunt called and asked me, Where are you? I literally felt my heart drop because I had no idea. This guy was just staring at me. I said I don't know and asked him, Hey, where did you take me? He replied with, I wouldn't know what to tell you, kid. That was enough for me. I grabbed my backpack and opened the door real quick with a loud, that's fine, I'll see myself out, and I hauled ass like I hadn't in a very long time. I remember even being afraid of carrying my backpack on the back in case he'd chase me and pull on it, so I was holding it with my hand with my hoodie wrapped around my waist as I thought of where to hide. I thought of knocking on someone's door, but for some reason that didn't seem safe to me at the moment. I remember my aunt telling me not to hang up because he was still following me in the car. Then I saw an empty barren surrounded by concrete walls and a strong bar gate, except there was enough space under the gate to crawl in. I literally threw the backpack and then crawled under. There was a huge electric control box and I opened it to crouch inside and hide. My aunt was still on the phone. She. My other aunt and my uncle were all on call with each other, putting credit on my phone and asking for my live location through WhatsApp because I had no idea where I was. I was literally in the middle of nowhere. I waited there for up to two hours. This guy wouldn't leave. I even had to go pee outside the box and immediately ran back inside. There were even tiny spiders and old honeycombs so I was also fighting both my arachnophobia and trypophobia. At some point, I'm guessing the guy left and my uncle got there in his truck. He didn't know where I was, so he kept honking and told me to tell him when I could hear if it was close. 
I finally did and then go out. For a while, I thought maybe this had been a misunderstanding, that I just jumped out of some guy's car like a manic without even paying him. But then when I got home, after staying at my aunt's pharmacy for a while, until my mom, who still didn't know much about what had happened, picked me up. I checked the Uber app, and not only did it say I already paid, but it also said I made it to my destination. So I ruled that out. I had told my aunts not to tell my mom about it, because she does go insane at the minor inconvenience. So telling her this would only freak her out, and she wouldn't be any help. I only let her know when I called her to come get me, and on our way to get a copy of that key. Because of course, something bad had to happen until she actually listened to me. And nowadays, she always puts credit on my phone. Anyway, so that's what went down. I had to Indiana Jones that shit twice, and to this day, my family brags about how I was able to keep myself perfectly composed and react quickly, which I'm still shocked about. I remember seeing broken glass and metal bars laying around and telling my aunt, if I'm going down, I'm taking him with me, in a joking manner, because her blood sugar levels were fucking her over. On our way home, my mom told me I wasn't in hysterics because I was in shock and that it would hit me the next day. It didn't. I kept going around as normal. But last week, she brought it up again. She asked if I didn't think I was going to die. I said of course, but that I also knew freaking out would only either make me an easier target or just not help in any way. When I remember it, more than scared, I feel angry. I could have been one of the many girls who just disappear and are later found dead on a random hill or in a ditch. I can't say I suffer survivor's guilt, because in all honesty, I don't. But I can't help but think, that could have been me. Whenever another kid or teenager is on the news as missing or found dead, it really could have gone terribly wrong. My parents believe this guy was a rookie who maybe felt sorry for me and let me go. Because if he had wanted to, he could have hurt me with some sort of weapon or just try to kill me right then and there. I don't even know anymore. I sent his profile to all the girls I know so that if they ever get him as an Uber driver, they can cancel. Since then, I don't take Ubers anymore. Wherever this guy is right now, I don't want to be ever again. This happened when I was 17 years old. I'm from Bosnia and used to go fishing with my friends whenever I could. When the summer break began, we used to explore many rivers. Usually we would encounter animals or people, but nothing special. Keep in mind that the legal driving age in Bosnia is 18, so we would usually take a bus to a location or just walk to it. One night, me and my friends sat on a bus, and we went to a city not too far away. We arrived at the city, and before exiting the bus, an old creepy drunk guy said, Are you boys going fishing? To which I replied, Yes, at the lake. He added, Well, good luck then. I hope you catch some fish. Followed with a really creepy laugh. Anyway, we arrived at the lake, which was very beautiful, and then we started fishing. At around 1.30, after we had some beers, we could hear arguing in the distance. One of my friends took a flashlight and pointed it in the distance, and as he went over a bush, somebody clearly crouched down. As there were many of us, we weren't really scared. Me and the friend with the flashlight went to investigate, while the others stayed near the campfire. Upon arriving at the bush, 
we spotted the same old drunk guy crawling in the grass. We asked him what he was doing, to which he replied that he was hunting. We didn't see any weapon on him whatsoever. I proceeded to ask him what he was hunting without a weapon. He got up and said, Look, this is a coincidence. I'm gonna get going. While stumbling away, we returned and tried to enjoy the rest of the night. At around 4 a.m., we hear somebody angrily shouting in the distance. We turn around and spot this buff guy in a black shirt, covered in tattoos. Behind him was the old guy. What do you think you're doing on my property? He said to us. Sir, we were fishing and didn't know this property was yours. In this argument, I could see my friends packing the fishing rods and all the things we brought. My friends made a run for it in the forest, leaving me and another friend. Okay, you're gonna call your friends and tell them to come back, or else you're not leaving, the buff guy said. I, of course, did not want to do that, as I did nothing bad. We were quiet, just talking and doing nothing to disturb anyone. Plus, the river was like 300 meters away from the houses. My friend tells the man we're going and starts to walk. Now, this is where it gets scary. The guy grabs my friend by the neck and starts to argue with him again. I jumped in and hit the guy in the face and started running toward the road. He lets go of my friend and starts to chase after me. After running for about a minute, the guy gets tired. I end up exiting the trees and go onto the street. I wait on a bench for some time and see my friend coming. He sits next to me and tells me that when the guy started chasing me, the old guy jumped on him with a hunting knife. He thankfully missed my friend and he ended up pushing the guy and running as well. We called the cops after that. A patrol came and we gave our statements. We called our other friends and ended up meeting up with them. The cops explained to us that the part where we had been was private property, but again, the fact that the guy grabbed my friend by the neck was not how he should have reacted. We ended up going home, and nowadays, we laugh at this story. Around three to four years ago, when I was 12, I was at my aunt's house visiting for camp. I was upstairs and saw the camera go off, saying someone was at the back door. It was my older cousin, so I went downstairs to open the door. I was able to see him for a little bit before I actually got to the door. He looked so determined and focused on opening the door. He spent less than a minute at the door. Then he got into his car and sped off. I didn't think much about this, honestly. Although I did think, oh, he must have been in a rush if he didn't bother to call us to open the door. I was even thinking about opening the door and calling out to him before he drove off. But I was feeling lazy that day. About two minutes later, the house phone started ringing, along with my personal phone and my grandma's phone. I picked it up and it was another one of my aunts telling me not to open the door, to stay away from the windows. They told me they already called the cops, but that I should call again. I was very confused and asked what happened. They explained that my aunt and cousin got in a very heated argument about the business she owned the day before, and that led to him hitting her. The next day, he came looking for her, very upset, but he couldn't find her at the office. He proceeded to drive to my aunt's house while on the phone with some family members, telling them how he was going to kill my aunt, his mother. I remember going to the kitchen and picking up a knife to keep with me, just in case. I was shaking while thinking about where to hide. He ended up coming back and he started walking around the house, looking through the windows before he sat at the front step. 
Luckily, I was on the second floor. I don't even know what exact time I called the police due to my panicking. The cops ended up coming and made my cousin leave, but my grandma wanted to talk to him first. Throughout their whole talk, I still hid upstairs listening through an open window. I prayed she didn't mention my name in case he came back later in the night. Luckily, he never did. To this day, I'm so glad I didn't open the door. I felt like I was truly protected. We normally don't lock both the screen door and the actual door, but we did that day. He struggled so much with the lock on the screen door that he actually broke the handle. This situation still gives me so much anxiety. I don't understand how we went back to acting like nothing happened. I've never been back since, just in case he snaps again. Back when I was 18, my mom had been doing work in the garden, so she was exhausted and went to bed early. It was winter, so it got dark early. I knew I would be the only one awake for the next few hours until her partner got home from work at 4am. I went about my usual nightly routine, rolled a joint, and went out back to smoke it. I did that every night. The house has two floors, and my bedroom was on the top floor. After I had my smoke, I went back upstairs and continued watching whatever. About an hour later, I decided I would have one more joint, then head to bed. I finished rolling and got myself ready to head out into the cold. But just before I headed downstairs, something on my phone distracted me, and I sat back on the bed, concentrating on that. A minute or two pass, and I hear a loud bang from downstairs. I thought to myself, it's just my mom's partner coming home. Then, Seconds later, I realized I didn't hear the front gate open. I didn't hear the taxi pull up outside. I didn't hear the front door open. My cat is on the bed next to me, so it wasn't him, and my mom is asleep next door. So what the fuck was that bang? So, I grab my taser and stick it in my dressing gown pocket. I go into my mom's room. Normally, she's such a light sleeper. But because she was tired from gardening, she slept through the noise. I wake her up and tell her what I've heard. She gets herself ready, grabs a metal pole, and we head downstairs. I insisted on going first, because in all fairness, my mom's 5 foot 6 and 130 pounds. She has MS and is holding a flimsy metal pole. I figured my taser would be a little better should we encounter anyone. Looking around, Everything seems fine. However, the last room we check is the bathroom. To find that the window that sits just above the bath is wide open, and our two one-liter bottles of Tresemme shampoo and conditioner, which were on the windowsill, had been knocked into the bath. Of course we're like, what the fuck? How could this happen? The wind, maybe. Obviously not. We were just really scared and trying to make ourselves feel better. It's like 2.30 in the morning at this point, and my mom calls her partner to tell him someone has just tried to break in through the window, and blah blah blah, please come home. And his response, oh, it's probably just a fox or something, close it and go back to bed, you're both just being paranoid. What? So we both come to the conclusion that he's no help. So we make sure everywhere is secure and call 101, which is the UK's non-emergency police, and we report it. Five minutes after calling, four police cars and dogs all turn up. They look around and then come to the door and ask the obvious questions. After doing a walk around the house and the area, they come back again. They ask us if we usually keep our plastic gardening chairs under the bathroom window. No. No, we don't. 
The police advise us that a dodgy gang have been going around the area, trying doors and windows to try to break in and steal whatever. They must have taken the garden chairs to stand on to help them get in. The police also advised us that a house a few streets over had just been broken into. Everything was taken and the house was destroyed on the inside. I don't think they were ever caught. The thing that freaks me out the most is, had I not got distracted by my phone before going out the back to smoke, I would have been outside sitting on the same chairs in the pitch black where the intruders would have come around and seen me, and God knows what would have happened then. This happened in New York City, years ago when I was a freshman in college. I was out partying one night with some friends. I wasn't drunk or on any hard drugs, but I definitely smoked a blunt or two. Around 3am we went our separate ways and I got off the train and began walking home. I had to take a longer route home that night because some train lines were under maintenance. When I got off the train, I realized I had to walk past the cemetery. I started to feel uneasy, but I wasn't afraid for any real reason. About ten blocks and I'm home, I always saw trucks lined up on the cemetery blocks, and being it was a desolate area, I assumed truckers would park their trucks by the cemetery to take naps or sleep before continuing their routes. Back then, I thought nothing of it. A few minutes after getting off the train, I heard a faint sound of what I guessed was a car or truck door being shut behind me. I turned around and saw nothing. I scanned my surroundings once quickly and I didn't see one other person behind or ahead of me for as far as I could see. I keep walking, this time a bit faster, and about a minute later I hear footsteps behind me. I turned so quick and saw a man walking fast a few feet behind me. When he saw me turn, he began catcalling me by making kissing noises. I was used to these catcalls, especially living in New York City. By my house, there would be a line of men on the corner every morning, waiting to be picked up for construction work. Every time I passed them to go into the store, I would get catcalled and harassed. So I ignored him and kept walking, but definitely faster this time. A few seconds later, he was running to catch up with me, and he was now at my side, speaking to me in Spanish. He grabbed my arm tightly and began pulling me toward him when I started screaming and fighting him off. He pushed me up against the cemetery fence, and in the midst of this, my heart sunk to the floor as I thought about the worst things that could happen to me. Seconds later, he had me off my feet by both arms. His face turned white in the moonlight, a face of pure horror as he looked past me into the cemetery, fixated on something. He let out a blood-curdling scream and let me go. As I dropped to the floor, he was already across the street and running out of sight. Choking on tears, shaking, beside myself, I picked myself up and ran so fast the last few blocks to my house. I did not turn to look inside that cemetery once. I did not turn around at all. I did not stop until I was home. I never took that train or walked past that cemetery again. And to be honest, I never told my parents. I only told a handful of friends over the years because this day, I still don't understand what happened, but something probably saved my life.
I never really sat down and written all this out before. I keep getting reminded about it, so I figured I could post it somewhere to kinda, I don't know, vent I guess. So first of all, the woman I call Nana in this story isn't actually related to me, but for most of my life, she and her husband were like grandparents to me. I grew up poor and they lived in a nice house, so going to their house was like a really cool vacation. Well, when I was 12, Nana's husband died from lung cancer. It was rough on me since his funeral was held on my 12th birthday but it was obviously rougher on Nana. She changed after that. She started acting like you'd expect someone to act if they were going through a midlife crisis. She bought a stripper pole, got a back tattoo, and things like that, even though she'd been pretty conservative before. And then she, out of nowhere, started dating and married another man. Really fast. His name was T. At first, T didn't seem too bad. He was kind of weird, but I just thought it was because he was the new guy, as it were. Now T, you need to know, was probably in his late 50s to early 60s. I was only 15 or 16 when I met him. The first red flag came after T offered to take me for a ride on his motorcycle. I thought riding on a motorcycle would be cool, since I'd never done it before and he was Nana's husband. What did I have to worry about? So we're on the motorcycle and he's driving me around. Everything's fine, and then he tells me I need to scoot closer and hold on tight or I'm gonna fall off. Obviously, I listened to him, and that was the first time he touched my leg. It was just a pat on my shin. I didn't think anything of it, but then he did it again, and again, and again. At that point I was getting a bit uncomfortable, so I pulled away from him a bit. He tells me I need to hold on, and when I hesitate, he, no joke, tells me, I'm not trying to feel your chest on my back, I just don't want you to fall off. That should have been the moment where I told everyone he was a creep, including Nana, but I let it go like an idiot. Cut to a little while later, and T has continued to make me uncomfortable damn near every time I visit. But I still haven't told anyone anything. I wake up one morning and go to the kitchen to make some cereal. I'm wearing nothing but a long nightgown and panties. No bra or anything because I literally just woke up. Well, T comes into the kitchen and sees me standing at the counter. He walks up behind me wraps both of his arms around my waist and pulls me against him. I froze, but then he mumbled in my ear, you are so sexy, and then he walked away. That was the breaking point. I told my parents and then my then boyfriend, now husband, what had happened. I refused to go back to Nana's the next time she asked me to go, and when I told her why, her only response was, but he does that kind of stuff to everyone. Needless to say, I cut her out of my life for that. A few years down the line, I heard that T died. Nana came groveling to me, trying to get me to meet up with her. I went, but things between me and her have never gone back to the way they were. I suspect they never will. This encounter took place a few blocks from my house at around 1am about a year ago. I'm 6 foot 2 so I'm not used to people wanting to mess with me. My puppy was full of energy so I was going to take him for a walk to try to tire him out a bit. While my girlfriend drives to the gas station to get a snack or something. A few blocks from our place I see our car stop at the street corner. I can't see anything in the car, but I just assumed she saw our pup and wanted to say hi and check on us. So, as I get closer, the passenger rolls down the window, and thinking it's my girlfriend, I approach the car. 
instead of being greeted by my lady, I hear a man say, Hey, sexy. I laugh a little at first, thinking she ran into an old friend at the gas station and that she was giving him a ride, that they were just messing with me. I admit I was a bit high on ketamine, so I was taking a second to process the situation. The man asks if I want to hang out with him. I politely say no thanks, and then he says, I bet that thing is big in them sweatpants. I told him that he's fucking nasty and I don't swing that way. The guy then offers me 120 bucks to get in the car with him. I said, not a chance, I'm not like that. And I decide that my puppy and I need to get away from this guy. I start to power walk past his car. I had a bad feeling about this guy. He then yells for me to get the fuck in the car. The pup and I dip out of there and head back for home. The guy got out of his car for a second before getting back into it and taking off. We went around the block before the car rolled up again. I figured I couldn't outrun him, so I was ready to fight. When the window rolled down, it was my girlfriend asking if we needed a ride. We hopped in the car and I started bawling my eyes out. I couldn't even explain what happened until we were home. My girlfriend said that something told her to check on us. I believe this guy may have wanted to possibly kidnap me. It was very frightening and it gave me a whole new appreciation for what women go through all the time. I'm a 31 year old woman and I had a very uncomfortable experience working the other night. I wanted some thoughts to make sure I'm not uh, overreacting I guess. For backstory, I've been helping at a small family owned convenience store down the street from my house for the past few months. It's just a wife and husband and their niece so they needed someone else for a family emergency and they trust me. That said, it's kind of a uh, a shady gas station. Lots of strange people come through. I'm not exactly someone who blends into a crowd like this. Anyway, this guy came in earlier and I heard him say, Wow, when he saw me, and then he started complimenting my hair. I was like, Uh, thanks? And I told him his total. It's not an abnormal interaction, but it's just the way he looked at me that threw red flags all over the situation. After I gave him his total, he claimed he left his card in the car and was going back to look for it. I said it was no problem. I helped the other couple people in the store. A minute after those two left, he came back in. This time, he was holding his phone oddly to his chest, and then he started asking me where he was. I said, well, I think it'd be easier to tell you where you're going if you turned around. I told him the road, and he told me where, which was the very next town over. I just gave him basic directions back to the town he was going toward. It was literally a straight shot down the road he was on. He then started complimenting me about my eyes, my eyebrows, asked my height, my age, if I was single. I just redirected again or lied. After ignoring his last question, I asked if he still wanted the stuff he came in for. He said yes. I told him his total and he said he left his wallet in his car again. This was the same time another customer had pulled up. He had sat his phone down on the counter and forgot it when he walked out to get his wallet. It was open on video. I immediately started calling my husband, who is seconds away. Sure enough, I clicked the recent video. He'd been recording our conversation. I deleted it. Then I clicked recently deleted and deleted it there too. My husband answered the phone and he knows when I'm at work, if I call and don't speak, for him to be quiet and come to me right then. He walked back in, gave me a $5 bill 
and I asked him if he found his card. I also said his phone had been going off on the counter and to not forget it. He questioned about his card and then it was like he remembered. He said, Oh no, uh, I have other cards. Okay, then why did you need to leave to go get it? I just said to him okay and to have a nice day. So then he went and he sat in the parking lot with the door open until my husband pulled up. He went the opposite way my husband came and of course, neither of us could see a tag number. It was such a concerning encounter. I didn't like it at all. How were you lost holding a phone with signal obviously as it was getting messages and claiming to be lost when Google Maps exists and why were you recording me? What the actual fuck? I don't want to be at work anymore right now. This happened about 14 years ago, but I remember it vividly. I was waiting at the Orlando airport for my mom to fly in for vacation to see me, my daughter, and my then fiancé. Her plane had been delayed due to the weather and it was getting later and later. Finally, the airport was almost empty and it was almost midnight. I needed to use the restroom and told my fiancé to hang on to my daughter's stroller as he was falling asleep. I was not tired, I was excited to see my mom, and I had drank a few coffees. So I went into the women's room, and every stall door was open. I chose a random one and used it. All the while, it was completely silent in there. I left the stall and was washing my hands. The bathroom had that mirror that went all across the wall and I saw nothing. While washing my hands, I got a really weird feeling. I'd been looking down at my hands the whole time, and once I looked up, there was a scary-looking woman standing right behind me, almost touching me, leaning forward. We made eye contact in the mirror, and she said, Jesus loves you, do you know that? In an extremely freaky way. I was freaked out and just nodded while staring at her in the mirror. She then walked away and I couldn't see if she left the bathroom or not due to the design of the exit. I was shaking over the exchange because the tone she used, it was almost like saying Jesus saved me from her doing something awful to me. I never heard her come in and I'm a pretty paranoid person so I do pay attention to listening for people and things. Plus, those bathrooms echo so much, I would have heard the footsteps. I also never saw her hands, so I don't know if she had a weapon. I timidly left the bathroom, and my fiancé was standing near the bathroom, holding my daughter. I asked him if he saw the lady, and he had no idea what I was talking about. I looked around the area and it was empty. It was just us there. But to the lady with crazy dark and gray hair that was wild around your face, dark eyes, and oversized sweater, your face haunts me. If you were just trying to screw with me, it worked. I am still creeped out today. This happened to me about 15 to 16 years ago, when I was displaced in Las Vegas, after Hurricane Katrina occurred. I was 9 years old at the time, and I lived in this cul-de-sac of townhomes. Without sharing all the details, this was the first time I ever had a friend who lived in my neighborhood. So he and I would often hang out from the early mornings to about 11pm or so. One night, while we were outside, hanging out, there was this ice cream truck that was passing around. It hadn't turned on the typical music you hear when a truck's approaching, but when I got near, it began to light up and play the music. 
My friend and I, who was about the same age as me, approached the truck to see what it had to offer. I decided I didn't want any ice cream, likely because I didn't have any money to buy any, but my friend wanted some. He explained what he wanted to the guy when the guy suggested he get into the truck and pick out which flavor, and the guy would give him the ice cream for free. For some strange reason, my friend was actually going to get in the truck when I yanked his arm and screamed something. Immediately after, we ran to our parents and explained to them what happened. After this, we'd have to be inside by the time the sun set. I can't say for sure what would have occurred, but I'm thankful neither of us got into that truck. For the last two semesters, I've ordered Uber Eats a lot, especially towards the end of the day. One night I was craving some Burger King, and I hadn't really eaten some lunch or dinner that day, so I was really hungry for anything. The fridge in my dorm was also empty. I went ahead and placed an order and waited, and waited. I waited until it got around 11pm when the order finally said it's on its way. This is where it gets weird. I checked the profile of the guy that was delivering it to me, and he'd only done a handful of orders before this, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now, I would notice after a couple of minutes that he'd stopped on my road near my college, and he would open the chat to message me. He told me my food was cold, and he was a mile and a half from the nearest Burger King. He asked me where I ordered from, and what street, and what number. I told him it was fine, just to bring it to me. He asked me again what I ordered and that he's gonna get it right now. I said to him to just bring what he had, it's fine, and then he said he didn't have my food. I questioned him, picking up on the fact that he said my food was cold. He said he got out of the car and it fell out and he stepped all over it, that it was on him and he was gonna replace it. I said fine. It should say my order in the details. He asked again what I would like. I repeated, it should say in my order summary. Now I know this is weird, but I didn't care at the time. I was so hungry and I just wanted to eat, even if it was cold. But the fact that he changed his story was very weird to me. After waiting a bit longer to see if he would keep his word and go back to get me my food, I was shocked to see that he continued going to my door. Once he got there, I stepped outside to see him pull up in his car. To summarize, he told me that he had bad news and that he didn't have my food, but that he had something else for me. This was when my instinct kicked in. I got my keycard ready to go back inside, since all outside doors to my dorm building automatically locked. He would go to his car and pull out a plastic box of chicken, and he said it was mine to have. I declined and started to go back inside. He would continue to make remarks about he knows how I'm feeling, and that he was hungry in college too, all while walking toward me. I was having none of it. I told him I would be cancelling the order and getting my money back. Ever since then, I've never ordered Uber Eats late at night. I can only imagine what his true intentions were. One thing that confused me about this is what actually happened to my order. At first he said he was on his way to get it, despite Uber Eats saying he already had the order and was on his way. After a little while, he then changed it to the order being cold, that he was going to go out and get it again for me. Finally. He would say that he dropped it. Now, I think what really happened is that he ate the order, which could have led to malicious intentions with his box of chicken. I've been debating about telling this story but I need to get it off of my chest. 
This encounter happened a few weeks ago. To set things up, I live on the very end of my street. Next to my house is an empty lot, overgrown with trees and other plant life. There used to be a house there long ago, but for some reason it was torn down. Ever since then, it's been empty, but it always gave me strange vibes. So it was late one night, around 3am or so. I was driving back home after hanging out with my partner. I parked in my driveway, got out of the car, and then I heard this noise. I heard meowing, but it sounded like something mimicking a cat. It sounded like one cat meow being played on a loop over and over again. There was no pitch change. It was just a loop. I hope that makes sense. It did not sound like a cat at all. I don't know whether it was a human or not, but it was not a cat. Suddenly, I got this weird urge to go towards the noise, even though my body was sending alarms to get the hell out of there. I took a few steps, then suddenly shook myself out of the trance I was in. I felt so much fear and anxiety and made a run for my front door. If there's one thing about me, it's that I'm super paranoid and would never go towards a strange noise. I don't know what got into me. I don't know what that thing was. I live smack dab in the middle of Texas. I don't know whether it was some creepy cryptid or a bird. Whatever it was, it's scared the living hell out of me. I'm a 20-something female student at a pretty big university in the Midwest. I work as a desk clerk at one of the student libraries. I basically check books and equipment in and out, give directions for the building and area, and help the patrons with what they may need. I'm also quite talkative and friendly, and that makes me a good customer service employee, one that people will stop to chat with. I know all the regulars by name, and most of the people I see in the library are really great people. Most. One night around 9pm, another library employee, Mark, shows up to chat. He works in another department that has him walking all around the building, so he frequently passes my desk and says hi. I had a headache, so I really wasn't up for casual conversation, and knowing Mark pretty well, I told him that I wasn't feeling very well and was eager to get off of work soon. He wished me well and went off on his way. During this exchange, a patron had come up behind Mark to wait for my attention which was normal considering I work at the front desk. As Mark leaves, the man steps up to take his place in front of my desk and just stares at me for a second with an uneasy smile on his face. I'd seen him a few times mulling around the library in recent weeks. He usually just sat in the cafe area reading a local paper. He looked to be about mid-thirties and wore pretty nice clothes so I didn't think he was homeless or anything like that. He said he overheard that I wasn't feeling well and asked if I wanted him to grab me a drink from the vending machine down the hall as the cafe closed at 8. I politely declined, obviously not wanting to take drinks of any kind from strangers. He seemed a little miffed but didn't mention it. He then said he also overheard that I got off soon and asked if I wanted him to walk me to my car. Becoming wary and alert, I again declined and started to consider my options for escape. The desk is only staffed by one person at a time on weeknights, and considering it's the spring semester, there are just not a lot of people around the library. With no co-workers to cover the desk for me, I can't leave. My boss works up on the second floor in the admin offices, but I know my favorite supervisor isn't working today. This meant I couldn't get a supervisor down here without a legitimate reason. Even if I call upstairs, I can't very well explain the situation over the phone because it's literally right next to me, and this guy would overhear everything. Who knows what he would have done? Not really sure what to do next, 
I turn around to hide the confusion and fear on my face. I stood and grabbed the disinfectant wipes and began wiping the counters, just to have a job to do rather than sit idly with this creep standing at my desk. I'd only been turned away from him for less than a minute when I heard keyboard clicks at my computer. I whirled around and see that he has my Facebook page open. He must have done some keyboard command to switch tabs because my Facebook was open and logged in, but in a different tab when I left the computer. Now this is obviously very bad because now this guy has my first and last name. Shit. At this point, I'm scared. But honestly, in the moment, I was just pissed off. I asked him what he was doing as he turned the monitor at an angle so he could see the screen and was analyzing my profile. He then said, Oh, so your name is Abigail Watson. Nice to meet you. Obviously, I couldn't lie and say it was someone else. I mean, my profile picture is my face for Christ's sake. This shit really got to me. I told him how rude that was and how it was an invasion of privacy. He responded by saying it was on a public computer, so it was public property. Yeah, fucking right. He made a move toward me and leaned over the desk a bit and tried to grab my arm. I was about to start getting heated when Mark came down the stairs, saying he'd heard me from the stairwell. I must have been talking pretty loud at this point. I was visibly pissed, as Mark could see. As I explained that he tried to buy me a drink and walk me to my car and went as far as basically stealing my personal information from my Facebook page. Now also pissed at this point, Mark stepped right up into the guy's face. Mark's a pretty big burly guy. He told him to forget my name, my face, and get the hell out of there. The creeper guy put his hands up and smirked as he took a few steps back with the old, Hey man. It's cool. I'm just trying to make some friends out here. I scoffed audibly. I told him I'd be calling building security if I saw him at my desk again. He told me to fuck off and called me ugly before storming off and leaving. Mark asked if I was okay. I asked him to cover the desk for a few minutes while I went up and explained what happened to my boss. He was also pretty pissed at this guy and told me he'd get security to look at the camera footage to maybe ID this creep, and that he'd be banned if he showed up again. Turns out, he was a student here a while back, and had a history of stalking female students. Fucking gross. I haven't seen him since. I called campus police, but never really heard back. Mark now makes rounds to my desk when I work nights. Me, my sister, and my mom have been trying to make sense of this for the past couple of hours, and the facts get less comforting the more we compare our experiences of that night. So last Friday night, I was home alone while my family stayed in their cabin a few kilometers away. I'm used to staying home alone as this exact scenario is very common in the summertime, especially while I'm working and can't travel from the cabin and back. I'm not usually jumpy or afraid while home alone anymore. I'm used to the odd creaks and settling noises of our house. I was especially comforted by the fact that my sister's dog was also in the house with me that night, and most noises could be attributed to him. If anything were to happen, he would act as a guard dog of sorts and alert me to anything odd. At the same time, however, he is the type of dog to bark at any noise or person walking past the doors or windows, so I'm used to hearing him bark or growl at night. Even so, this past Friday, the sound of his barks at nearly 12am were disconcerting, to say the least. Despite my comfort with staying home alone, I am still terrified of the premise of a break-in or some other uninvited human interaction at midnight. I let him bark for a few seconds, telling myself it was just someone walking past our glass door in the adjacent alleyway, and he would quiet down once they passed. Needless to say, that's not what happened. He kept barking and growling for a few moments too long. 
I finally got out of bed and walked upstairs to check it out. As I'd suspected, he was standing alert at the glass door. I was comforted for a moment until I walked over, ready to close the curtains and go back to sleep. I saw the door open, about two or three inches. I froze. I'd let our dog Bosco out earlier that night, but I know I closed the door. I've never left this door open. I'm a paranoid person with bad anxiety, especially concerning break-ins and the like, so I would never, home alone, forget to close the door. I am 100% certain. But at the time, I didn't let myself think about these facts, or even acknowledge that I could not have left the door open, because I knew it would send me into a spiral, possibly even an anxiety or panic attack, if I didn't explain it this way. I closed and locked the door, double checking that it was certainly locked. Using the flashlight on my phone, I looked around the entire second floor of my three floor house, including closets and other reasonable hiding spots, just to put my mind at ease. And upon finding nothing, I went back downstairs to my room. As I was down there, trying to push away the fear, I could hear Bosco walking around the floor that doubles as my bedroom's roof. I thought I was overthinking it when it started to sound like human footsteps, accompanied by Bosco's footsteps. He walks around for about 10 minutes before I put in my earphones and talk myself down until I can fall asleep. At 2am the same night, my sister comes home from work. I woke up a few times before this to Bosco in the basement whining at my bedroom door. When I got up to let him out, my sister walked in. We let him out the front door rather than the glass patio door, letting him in the same way. We talked for a while before I went back downstairs and my sister went to the bathroom. I forgot about the door, busy with work for the next few days. I forgot to mention it to anyone until tonight. My sister and my mom were home with me for a movie night while my dad and brothers stayed at the cabin. I remembered the door situation when we were picking out horror movies to watch. I was sharing it as a creepy, almost funny story before my sister spoke up, saying that the same night, an hour or so after they got home, the door was open again. The same door that was locked from the inside and had not opened since earlier that night. My stomach dropped and I started shaking the second this was revealed. We first started trying to explain it away. Maybe she let Bosco out and forgot to close it until we both recalled that we'd used the front door. Then we were trying to justify a reason someone would break in to not steal anything and proceed to stay for two hours before leaving. Ultimately, I realized that I quite possibly locked someone in the house with me, then forced them to hide upstairs while I searched the second level of our house. Then this hypothetical person would be trapped up there now, knowing that this house was not empty, and there was a dog who would bark if they showed themselves again, alerting me to their presence. Then, when I was in the basement and my sister in the bathroom, they ran out of the glass door, which is timed perfectly to when they found the door open once more, much wider than when I had found it, as though they were only in a hurry on the way out. Perhaps they left it open the first time for a quick escape, or to stop the loud sound of it meeting the door frame. Either way, either way it ties too perfectly for me to reasonably brush it off. I know it's unlikely, especially with nothing missing, but in this small town, there have been many reports of break-ins with nothing missing, vandalizing, or just breaking and entering many, many times, so it's not as unlikely as it may be in a bigger city. I can't make sense of this. I'm shaken up thinking of the possibility of someone being in my house while I was asleep, alone in the basement. There is a part of me that doesn't believe it, but I can't shake the too many coincidences that all tie together to make this as concerning as it is.
Okay, so this happened about a year ago. I'm in a long-distance relationship, and I often fly to visit. I didn't have a ride arranged to come pick me up, so I usually use Lyft or Uber to get to and from the airport. This particular ride started off fine. The guy was from Haiti, I believe he said so he had a very thick accent that was often hard to understand. The beginning of the ride was him just making small talk, like most drivers do. Where are you flying from? Are you in college? Do you have family here? And so on. We get on the freeway, and there's lots of traffic. I had a layover flight, and of course all the outlets were in use, so I couldn't charge my phone. I'm hoping this traffic lightens up, because I really need to keep in contact with the people I'm going to be staying with. Of course, with my luck, the app crashes and says, You have arrived. While we were literally in the middle of the freeway with no houses near us at all, I get kind of annoyed and the driver says he'll pull over at this Walmart nearby to figure out what's wrong. Apparently, he had a very old phone and it wasn't giving proper directions, so I said we could use mine but I needed to charge it. He asked me to sit up front so it was easier, and I thought nothing of it, so I did go up front. He tells me he will take me the rest of the way for free without using the Lyft app. I put the address in, and we're back on our way. As we're pulling out of the Walmart parking lot, he asks me how old I am. I told him I just turned 18, and that's when things got kind of weird. He seemed to lighten up at how young I was, which was a bit odd, but whatever. He then asks me a series of questions like, Why don't you live here in this state? You should move here. You could go to college here, so why don't you? I'm a doctor, and Lent is just a side job, so I have money. This man was at least in his mid-forties. I told him I had no money to just randomly move states and start college, seeing as I had just become a legal adult. He then told me, I can take care of you. I'll buy you a little apartment and a nice car, and take you out and pay for your college. I thought he was joking, so I kind of just awkwardly laughed and said that it's okay. He didn't need to do that. But he kept insisting, and I was getting kind of creeped out. I really didn't want to jump to conclusions. I thought maybe he's just not sure how to hold a proper conversation, being as he's not from the country or something. About 20 minutes later, we're about 5 minutes from my destination. My phone kept doing that annoying, charging, not charging, that phones do, when the charger wires are loose. I had this phone a while, so it did this at times, and apparently hadn't been charging much, and it died. Since we were so close to the destination though, I told him I knew the rest of the way, but I'd tell him to turn right, and he'd say okay, and purposely turn left or keep going straight. Anything but what I told him to do. Now we're lost because he's ignoring everything I'm saying, and playing it off as an accident. I'm not super familiar with the entire area, I only knew a small portion of the streets. He tells me he lives nearby, and I start getting really scared because I think he's going to kidnap me or something. I let out a single tear, and then I tell myself to keep it together because in the movies, whenever they see fear, they get mad or something. So I'm trying to make it seem like I'm not losing my shit. Finally, he turns back around, and when we're almost there again, he once more starts going the wrong way. At this point, I got my phone to about 5%. He reaches over while at a red light and grabs my phone. He rates himself 5 stars on Lyft and friends me on Facebook. He also puts his number in my phone and tells me to call him if I ever need anything and that we should go out sometime. I give a little fake smile so he doesn't know I'm about to shit myself from fear. Eventually I get so fed up, I just jump out at another red light and tell him, Thanks, but you're really scaring me. Bye. I call my boyfriend on my 5% battery life and tell him where I am because I'm really scared and I need him to pick me up. My Lyft driver is shouting out the window for me to get back into the car, but there's no way in hell I was going back in there to be some man's sugar baby that was also a total stranger at that. I go somewhere with lots of people and wait for my boyfriend. 
This whole ordeal made the ride last about two and a half hours. It should have taken 45 minutes, even with the traffic. Later I called Lyft and told him everything. He was supposedly fired, so that's good. I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night, I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail, so there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid-twenties walked by, carrying a fishing pole and small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came to say hi. I said hi and went back to reading, but then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy amused tone like, so you're just reading, and then looked behind me and noticed my tent and then said, Oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him I was trying to be alone to get him to leave. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark and just drilling into me. I just responded to him with, Uh-huh and yep, I just tried to pretend I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks a beer and lights a cigarette, and then he starts blowing it at me. At this point, I'm so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wanders by, and he strikes up conversation with him. I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend to need to get water, I went to the shore and filtered some water really slowly. I saw the man walk away and go sit with a new guy, which made me feel really relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rainfly pulled back and was watching the sunset, and also loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent, he stood maybe about a foot away from my door, looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but just started laughing really creepily. I asked, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I felt sick to my stomach and finally responded with, I'm taking a nap now, so have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily laughed. Later I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, well, at least what was written on his cooler. I'd also overheard him say where he was from to the other hiker, so I put that down in my notes app on my phone, just in case. I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving the camp that night, but ended up staying and just leaving really early in the morning in case he came back. Normally, while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not that bad as you're hearing it, but this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the back country. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from that guy. This happened many years ago. I was eight or so at the time, and every day I would walk home from my elementary school. My house was a few miles down the road, so my mother thought it would be safe enough for me to walk by myself. It was a few months into the school year when it started happening. A beat-up Toyota would slow down enough for a couple of white guys that looked like they were in their mid-twenties to follow me and yell insults at me. I was chubby back then, so they would call me fat, 
and much more hurtful things. I'll always remember the driver. He looked to be the oldest in the bunch, with greasy blonde hair hanging down and partially covering his pimpled, scarred face. They would follow me until I reached the gas station that was halfway along my journey home. Then they would speed off, laughing loudly. For the first couple of weeks, I didn't tell anyone, thinking they would get tired of it. They didn't. A full month passed before I told my mother about it. She, of course, was rightly concerned about me and asked me how long it had been going on for. When I told her a month, she grew even more concerned. Her, being a single mom, couldn't pick me up from school because she was at work all day, so her solution was to send my older brother to meet me halfway. She thought it would deter them. It didn't. Another four months went by with them continuing to follow me and throw insults at me. Then suddenly it stopped. A whole month went by without them driving by, and we thought everything was safe again. We were wrong. Suddenly, out of the blue, I saw the old beat-up Toyota heading down the road towards me. Only the driver was in the car this time. He slowed down, flung open the passenger door, and proceeded to yell for me to get into the car. I was so scared I couldn't even speak. I just shook my head no and tried to walk faster. He continued to follow me, demanding that I get into his car. I'll never forget the look on his face as he yelled at me. It was so full of rage. We finally got to the gas station and I made a break for it. I ran inside the gas station and up to the gas station attendant. I told him what was happening and he let me hide behind the counter. The driver pulled into the gas station hopped out of the car and came in. He demanded that the gas station attendant tell him where I was, claiming I was his daughter and I jumped out of his car. The gas station attendant glanced down at me and I shook my head wildly mouthing that I did not know this man. The gas station attendant said he didn't know what he was talking about and that he had to leave the store immediately. The driver began to yell wildly, and start walking around the store looking for me. The gas station attendant said he was going to call the police if he did not leave. The man turned to him and said something I'll never forget. I'll get that bitch, one way or another. The driver stormed out of the gas station and left. I sat there on the floor crying for what felt like hours. The gas station attendant called the police and had them come over. When the police arrived, the attendant told them what had happened. A police officer knelt down beside me and asked me my side of the story. I told the officer everything, how him and a couple of others had been following me for months, how they would follow me and insult me, how they suddenly stopped, and how he tried to get me into his car. I don't remember much afterwards other than them calling my mother and her meeting at our house. They took my mother's statement and then left. After that, my mother changed her work hours in order to come get me every day. For years I lived in fear that the man with greasy hair and pimple-scarred face would eventually get me. So, to the man who followed me for months, insulting me and eventually trying to get me into his car, I'm not that scared little girl anymore. We better never meet. So, I moved into this place a couple of months ago with my parents. We also have a dog. A couple of weeks after we moved in, I tried to open the attic door. There was no ladder. Just with a broom, it almost opened and halfway dropped, but it seemed like it was being held up by someone. I didn't bother and thought it could have just been stuck. Two weeks later, I go back to look at the attic, and the door is in the spot that it was originally in. Weird, I thought. A month or so later, my dog usually doesn't have problems with me and my family leave the house. But now there's something up with my dog. She will hide under the table and start to panic. At night, I usually hear footsteps and loud bangs sometimes. 
My parents are deep sleepers and don't wake up during the night, so I know it's not them. When I wake up, I go to check out the loud bangs, but nothing has fallen. I don't know if I'm going crazy or I'm just nervous. I went around my house checking any closets and crawl spaces. I didn't find anything. After that, I went to try to open the attic door, but it seems like it's been boarded up, like shut from the inside. It could have been the old owners, or there is someone in my attic. I decided to call the police. They sent out some officers to check it out. Upon inspecting the attic, the police found a sleeping bag and a ton of boxes full of stuff, but they didn't find anyone. I'm thinking it could have been the old owner's stuff, or at some point, there was someone in my attic. I'm really shocked, but comforted that there's nobody currently in my attic. My parents and I are going to board up the attic to make sure nothing like this happens again. I moved out of state to a very small town. The first day of moving in, a neighbor walking his dog greets me and introduces himself to me. He gives me a quick rundown that the neighborhood is filled with tweakers and other shady types. I took that as a general warning that that may be all I'll deal with. A few months later, he invited me over to his place to teach me how to do some woodwork. As we're making a shelf for my cat to sit on, he's asking me questions. To me, they were normal everyday questions, but looking back, I realize now he was trying to get information out of me. Why did you move out here from out of state? Who lives with you? Do you have any other family members in the state or area? Once we were done, we went to install the shelf, and he met my mom who stays with me. He talks to her for a bit, and then we left to walk back to his place. He starts telling me that he can see our yard from his place, and notices that I barely go outside with my dogs. He told me not to worry that if someone breaks into our place, that he can see them and shoot them from his room. That's what I'm thinking. How is that possible? Because you live over half a block away. Before I can question him, he asks if I want to see more of the town. I'm like, yeah, let's go. He walks out to his car and pulls something out from the middle compartment, and then tells me to go in his pickup truck. So I do while he's filling the gas tank up with some gasoline. Once he's done, he walks over to the driver's side and opens the door. He drops a holster between us. He tells me not to worry about it as I look, trying to see if there's a gun or not. As we're driving, I realized he hasn't said a word for five minutes, and this guy loves to hear his own voice. Another thing I noticed is that we're on a dirt road, and I haven't seen a single house, trailer, or vehicle for a while. I guess I gave off some nervous vibes because he suddenly says, So yeah, unless you know where you're going out here, you'll get lost, and it's best to have a pickup or ATV to drive out here. After about another 10 minutes of silent driving, we get to a little creek. Luckily there was another truck there. All he says is, Oh, look at that. Someone else is here with us, and he grabs his holster and gets out. We both see a lady with a big dog playing in the water. She turns to us as she sees him walking closer to her. She gestures to his holster, and he tells her not to worry, that it's for the snakes. She lifts her shirt above her waist to show her gun, and she tells him she's not worried one bit. They talk for a few minutes, and she tells him that her husband is home waiting for her to make dinner. She's just out letting the dog have some playtime. The neighbor changes his tone and posture from confident to defensive now. She called her dog and they went to their truck. He's watching her and she hasn't started her truck yet. A few minutes pass and he tells me it's time to go too. When we get to his truck, she drives off. The drive back, I start to get uneasy and creeped out. Why would he drive me all the way out there and just leave? Why tell me not to worry about the holstered gun, but tell the lady what it's for? 
I finally get out of my head and just break the silence and give him my life story as to why I moved. Finally, he responds that he can relate to my story and gives me a rundown of how the town is and what it's about, and that some people are more racist than others, and I should watch my back for that. Once we get back to his place, I tell him I have stuff to take care of at home, and I nope the hell out of there. I said to myself, if I'm ever going to hang out with him again, it won't be alone. I'm an 18-year-old kid in culinary school. This happened back in 2009. Our program has an underground parking lot attached to a lounge of our own, located behind the cafeteria. Couples like going there because it's always empty and partially dark. I hated it because it had a back door leading to the parking lot that was barely lit up. Barely anyone parked there, and so I found it creepy. Plus being a horror fan, I knew that that was a perfect opportunity for things to go wrong. Long story short, I come out of class one day and this kid I don't know starts walking up to me, almost confrontational like. I have my knife set with me and pull out a handle, readying to defend myself. He stops and hands me a paper. It reads, meet me in the lounge. I look at him in confusion and ask who sent him the note. Was it my boyfriend or someone in the culinary program? or maybe a friend from high school. He shakes his head and says he doesn't know, but I should go. I question him on what this person looks like, and he refuses to give me any information. I chuckle nervously, put the note in my pocket, and walk past this kid to head to class. He starts following me, asking me if I'm gonna go. I try ignoring him, heading towards the library to get into a public place. He follows. He tries telling me I should go, that it's my destiny or some shit along those lines. I glare at him and pick up the pace, trying to head downstairs to the cafeteria in hopes of finding a classmate and losing the kid. He runs at the same pace, telling me he doesn't understand why I'm not going. I tell him, because I don't want to, now go away, and I head into the cafeteria. By now, he's really creeping me out. I grab for my phone to call the police, but instead see a classmate and run towards him. The kid follows me, pointing towards where the lounge is and telling me I'm going the wrong way. I instantly panic and tell my classmate what's going on. He approaches the kid and tells him to leave me alone, that I have a boyfriend and I'm not interested. The kid tells me that they're waiting for me in the lounge and not to take too long. His words just gave me chills. My classmate walks me to our student restaurant and asks for some others to come with us. Three of my other colleagues come with us to the lounge. There's no one there. I get freaked out and decide I need to go home. They walk me through the campus to the parking lot where I can call my parents to get a ride. One of the others stays with me while the classmate who defended me goes to report the behavior to our teachers, who use the lounge as a secondary office sometimes. He then comes back to tell me that they're going to investigate and keep an eye out for suspicious activity, or that kid. A few days later, I learned that a girl had been assaulted in that area, having parked there during finals and gone in through the lounge. The school newspaper had reported it, but there were no details as to who did it to her, and if they were caught. I felt my stomach drop, hoping that the girl was okay, and hoping that those people get caught. I reported my incident to the newspaper team, but they claimed she never dealt with anything like a note. They never found the suspects. My mom is glad I listened to my gut and did not go. To this day, I still get chills thinking about it. The girl recovered and escaped with a few minor injuries. They never caught the attackers, and I never saw that strange kid again. All I can think of is, why me?
If they were going for money, I was so poor, I literally lived off sesame crackers, donated by classmates because I had no money. I'm just glad the girl is okay, and that I listened to my gut. Who knows what would have happened if I'd gone. This happened back in the 90s when I was still in primary school. I really had no clue how much danger I was in. I would have been around 11 years old, living in a regional city of Australia. For the last year, I'd been having a lot of trouble at school, getting bullied a bit by classmates, and felt really singled out by my teacher. My mom worked around the corner from my school, so when everything would get too much at school, I would literally just walk out of class down the road and onto her work site. It would take me about half an hour to walk there, a longer main road. A couple of times I noticed a small white car driving past me slowly, but I only noticed this because I would see the same car go up and down the street as I was walking, and while I was sitting outside of my mom's work site. After a while, I started seeing the same car driving up my street at home, and parked along the streets that my brother and I would ride our bikes around in. I don't remember thinking it was strange, because it was a small town, and it wasn't unusual to see the same cars or people. It was just like, oh, there goes that car again. Anyway, my family followed a serious routine. Mondays, swimming and tutoring. Tuesdays, netball training. Wednesdays, netball game. Thursdays, basketball training. Fridays, we would go and see professional basketball or football, depending on the season. Saturday was my brother's basketball games, and Sundays were our day to go to the river with friends for swimming and a barbecue lunch. It never changed unless someone was sick. So one Friday night, I'm getting dressed and ready to go watch the basketball game, but I can't find my shoes. I'm pretty sure that they're in the car which is in a garage under our two-story house. To get it, I would have to walk down the outside steps at the front of the house, which has a full view of the road. I walk out the front door, and at the end of our driveway is a small, white car. Now, I've never taken that much notice of the white cars up until this point, and it wasn't uncommon for cars to be parked in this exact spot for our neighbors, but I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach when I looked at it. I kept walking down the stairs, and as I got close to the bottom, the driver's side door opens, and the man gets out quickly. I keep walking to the garage, and he starts moving toward our driveway. That was the point when something inside me just told me to scream for my parents, and run and lock myself in the car. I did exactly that, and then this guy turned around, ran back to his car and drove off. By the time my parents came out, there was no evidence that this had happened, and they didn't believe me. A week later, there was a notice in our school newsletter about a man in a white car attempting to abduct another child from my school on the same night. My parents were very shaken and took me seriously after reading that. I don't believe he was ever caught but it definitely taught me to listen to my intuition and to take notice of my surroundings. My family and I went on a trip to the Hawking Hills area of Southern Ohio a few weeks ago. There was a place that I always wanted to visit, the abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I've never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect, but I did know it was pretty deep in the woods. We took a trip from our rented cabin using Google for GPS to the location. We start driving and it's, for lack of better words, real impoverished where we are driving. Hills have eyes ask. We literally only see a few cars on the way there and are on the back roads. We get to a point where we need to enter into a forest and we're close to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For a bit of additional information, 
I drive a Mercedes that I'm just lucky to have and have my husband in the car. I also have my 10-year-old nonverbal autistic son and my 6-year-old daughter. We drive down this real creepy stone road into the forest and there's nothing back there. No houses, no cars, nobody. We see signs that were close and pull into the parking lot. We walk over the footbridge and make our way toward the tunnel, which is a lot larger than I expected. We hear this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel that goes into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck comes driving through the tunnel toward us while we're on foot. The man gets out of the truck with a chainsaw. It's a white guy in his 60s. He walks with my entire family everywhere we go and through the tunnel. I try to make small talk with him and get some information. Things like if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources and that kind of thing. But he really wasn't budging. We turn around to walk out of the tunnel and he starts using the chainsaw behind us. The sound is just echoing through this tunnel. At this point, we have no cell phone service and literally no one knows my family is out there except for us. I was already worried my car was sending the wrong idea to people like we have money or something, which we don't. We rush to the car to get the kids in their booster seats and this man comes driving over the footbridge in his truck toward us in the parking lot. I honestly don't even know how his truck fit on it. He stops again, gets out of his truck and starts walking the other direction, much to our relief. About this time, I notice there are dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his, and we compared his hands and my son's. They were not a match. I don't know who could have touched the car, because we were with the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. We get out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later, I look in my rearview mirror, and there's a bunch of dust kicked up behind us. And there he is. He had to have driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us like that. There's nowhere to go in these woods. The road is basically one lane and we have no cell service or GPS. Every time I think we lose him, he's there again. I'm waiting for my tires to get popped or something, or for this guy to ram me off the road and into the ravine in the woods. Finally we get out of the woods, and it turns out he's still following us. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in the excitement. The guy in the truck was finally gone, and I turned around to go past the stone road that goes to the forest. There's one lone house near this road, and there is his truck, parked there. He had to have seen us drive onto this road into the woods, and taken a back way to the tunnel. I don't know if he was just trying to protect the site from more graffiti or what, but he really creeped us out. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. This is a story from 2019, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I guess due to trauma. I was bored at home alone. I FaceTime with my best friend and asked him if he would like to join me for a walk in the neighborhood. He wasn't there. He was on his way back from school, which is understandable, because it was a Thursday afternoon. Due to my massive boredom, I put on my sports clothes, a basic t-shirt, and some shorts that have no pockets. I then was headed with my music, vibing to the circuit. Arriving there, it was surprisingly not that empty. There were around 8-10 to 10 people in that 15 kilometer circuit. I started walking for a bit, then ran for a couple of kilometers, and then laid down in the grass. I noticed two guys on a motorcycle going back and forth. I didn't care that much since I was facetiming my two best friends. It was getting late, I think it was around 6pm, and I was exhausted. I walked home, but I took another path that's kind of a shortcut. I had to walk through an empty big street with buildings and construction. I had a feeling that someone was watching me and following me. I turned around and noticed the same two guys on that motorcycle heading toward me. I whispered to my friends on FaceTime that something weird's going to happen and that they have to cut their mics and focus with me. The guys came by and one of them asked me where the nearest barbershop is. 
Out of stress, I gave them a random location. While the rider of the bike asked me about the barbershop, my right eye twitched and unfocused, but I was still able to see with it. I saw in the bike's rearview mirror that the other guy was trying to look at where my phone was located. I was freaking out. Time was starting to slow down. Seconds felt like hours and I couldn't feel my legs anymore. They went on, but with a slow speed. It was like they were planning a backup plan. I had three options. Number one, there was a taxi guy fixing his car. I could have went to him and explained the situation, but my gut said what if they noticed me, came back, and maybe do what they planned to do. Number two, stop a random car, hop in, and then explain the situation. My gut said no, what if the car was locked? Plus the guys would have noticed that I knew they were planning to do something, and they might have come to me after the random car goes. And number three, this is what I chose. Run in the opposite direction into traffic and take the path that I came by. I instinctively ran for five straight minutes. I couldn't do it anymore. I entered a field and started running again to some slums. I looked back and I saw the guys coming after me into the field. One of them was shouting, Just stop. We just want to know where the barbershop is. There's one thing about me, and it's that I always trust my gut. And it said, No, run as fast as you can, or you will die today. And that's what I did. I ran between the slums and kept running until I arrived near my best friend's house. I told him to come down the stairs right now, and I laid down in the parking lot. He came to me and was freaked out because he knew that something was happening. But he didn't know what since I didn't give him more information. My face turned yellowish and I threw up. I couldn't feel my legs or my arms anymore. He walked me to my house and I laid down, and from that moment... I don't remember anything. I just remember me waking up the following day with bruises on my leg due to me running in the field full of pikes. I started working at my current summer part-time job last spring. I am situated in a large old building that used to be a country club but fell into despair about 10 years ago. Although there's nothing paranormal about my story, it is maybe worth mentioning that the former manager killed himself in the main office upstairs when they went out of business. It adds to the unsettling quality of this place. Along with that, so do the seemingly never-ending hallways and passages, innumerable hidey holes and half-empty pools, and other strange, unused parts of the building, like a secret shower room and sauna, and a tunnel of storage areas that connects the men and women's bathrooms. There are also a lot of doors to the outside in this place. It makes sense for a country club, but currently, we only use one small room for the golf course check-in, the kitchen, and one dining room for the upstairs, and a small cafe area for early morning golfers to get their coffee and beer. The cafe area is where I work. In the summer, we clock in to open the cafe before 6 a.m., often before the sun comes up. The golf course people come in pretty shortly after, but I would be the first person in the building every morning. I would unlock the front door, disarm the lock, walk downstairs in the dark, unlock this cage that keeps the drunkies at the bar upstairs at night from wandering downstairs and crawl along a long dark hallway with no windows to get to the light switch at the end of the hall. This always creeps me out, and I end up holding my keys between my fingers like brass knuckles. I act like a ninja sliding down the walls on the opposite side of whatever doorway is coming up, just because it's pitch black, and uh, I'm a scaredy bear. By the time I get to the end of the hall and flip the light on, my heart is always pounding out of my chest as I struggle to find the right key to let me into the cab. The whole situation started when Tim, a golf course employee, mentioned that he kept shutting the door between the men's locker room bathroom and the storage area that leads to the women's, and every time he would go back in there, it would be open again. This, along with some strange noises, was fodder for the bar regulars upstairs to claim this place was haunted by the old manager and whomever else they say died within these halls. 
Travis, a co-worker in the cafe, also mentioned that a few minutes after he opened, he went into the men's locker room and noticed that it was all steamy and smelled like soap, so he went into the shower room to investigate. Everything was sopping wet and still hot. He was the only person who was supposed to be there at that time of day, but he didn't see anyone, so he let it go. A couple of months later, Tim noticed this weird side door that you had to climb up a rickety old staircase on the side of the building, and it wasn't shutting correctly. So he fixed it, and it locked correctly, and he didn't think anything more of it. Shortly after, someone from the golf course came over to tell me they found someone's entire life packed away in one of the hundreds of lockers that no one uses. They thought someone was living in the storage room between the men's and women's bathrooms. He must have been coming in before the golf course people set the alarms when they left in the evenings, and after the cafe person, me, would come in and turn the alarm off in the morning. So that means that every morning, as I blindly shuffled my way down that long dark hallway alone, one of those pitch black doorways actually did have someone hiding behind it. A few days later, a red-faced, angry, bald man wearing Vietnam-era army-issue sunglasses came into the cafe and started screaming, puffing, and flailing his arms around, yelling about his stuff getting thrown out. He went over to berate the golf course people, so they asked him about the contents of the locker. His answers about specific items led them to realize that this was the man who was secretly living in one of the building's many dark passageways. I never found out much about him, whether he was dangerous or just homeless, but watching him scream about his stuff made it clear that he wasn't 100% rational. I still work there and do a darkness shuffle down the hallway every morning when I work. And although they say everything is on the up and up with the alarms and the doors locking, it still creeps me the hell out. And on a Monday, I noticed a pad of paper and a long metal pair of tweezers clipped underneath the stairs. I thought it probably had something to do with inventory, because right before, the manager came in to count our foodstuffs and beverages. It wasn't an area that's easily accessed by customers but it's not technically locked in any way during the day. And today, my friend who works at the bar upstairs told me that someone brought this pad to her. It has lots of stuff about how electric cars work to support some kind of government agenda surrounding social media and some plans to patent for some sort of alternative energy source that involved the UN and foreign passports. This is the part of the building that is not under video surveillance so I have no idea who left it, and if they were planning on coming back or not. It could be the same guy from before. He seemed pretty unhinged, and definitely likely to spend a lot of time in weird parts of this building. Hello, I would like to tell you of an encounter that resulted in a serious amount of fear and pain. A full, paralyzing fear where you just sink into yourself while your body shakes because you're so scared. As for pain, I would not feel any physical pain until the end of this event, but I can speak on a different pain. A distinct feeling that presents itself before the floodgates of pain flow in. I found myself on a seesaw of fear not wanting to climb any higher, but to get off altogether. But higher and higher I went, fear looking up at me with a smile as it propels me to experience fears I never thought I would experience. Fear of getting arrested, fear of getting robbed, fear of dying, and lastly, fear I may have to kill someone. To start off with, I'm what you would call a sex addict. Now I know identifying yourself as a sex addict comes off a bit silly, but after years of serious reflection and confrontation with traumatic events in my life, I feel as if the explanation fits my compulsions. It's not so much the act of it that I crave. The reason why I identify myself as one is, at some point in my life, I replace a search for emotional affection to feel fulfillment and happiness with the need for physical encounters. That hit of dopamine was all I needed. 
It is as if my ability to trust has been completely eradicated, and the common traits that so many look for in relationships are unnecessary to me to be happy. Instead, I can just hook up with someone. No emotions, no insecurities, no pressure. All the things that can hurt me or make me vulnerable are gone. The only comparison I can make is to a drug addict. The drug is enough. That short high temporarily gives you all you need without having to face any emotions, whether it be your past, present, or future. You can physically impose something to make you feel good. It's quite the oxymoron in that while the world views you as out of control, what drives my drug is the sense of control. However, what scares me about my sexual compulsions is what I'm willing to do to get that physical encounter I crave. I've never had a type which certainly helps, and without sounding like an asshole, I do rather well with the ladies. I'm not bad looking, educated, have my own house, and I respect women. I need to make that point clear, because I don't want any listeners to think my urge for physical relationships drives me to insanity, and that I violate women. Absolutely not. My angle is the intelligent nice guy. I don't have all the confidence in the world, and certainly will not approach anyone but I can hold a conversation and can be charming. Something I'm ashamed of is I believe I can be a true wolf in sheep's clothing. Most women believe they've met a guy who is committed and wants monogamy and love. I cowardly admit I rarely come out and let women know my true intentions. While my success rate is fair, it is still not the easiest thing to just randomly go out and pick a woman up for sex. Sure, I have done it but mostly every time was the one out of a million times I actually wasn't looking to bring someone home. My go-to was Tinder because honestly, it worked really well for me. I'm a talker and Tinder allows for conversations to start without having to confront all the other insecurities men and women face while trying to approach a stranger at a bar or somewhere random. However, the night I speak of, I wasn't getting any hits. I first started my night by going out. I had a few beers and looked for women to talk to, but the bars were empty, and those there did not look like they wanted to be approached. Again, my game is not to bother you. I can take a hint, and if you're out with the ladies and want nothing to do with men, I surely won't get in your way. While at the bar, I'm also checking Tinder to see if anyone has replied to my dumb ice-breaking jokes or responses reflective to their profiles. I wasn't receiving any responses. Then a thought I'm not proud of pops into my head, and I will admit it wouldn't be the first time I've thought about it. My thought was, maybe I should go pick up a prostitute. The town next to where I live has an insane amount of drug use, and poor souls who have the evil that is addiction often resort to desperate measures to secure money for their next fix. I hope you would believe me that when addressing my thought process, you must consider what my own addiction is and what it does to that thought process. I am sympathetic to women and know for most, selling your body is like selling a piece of your soul. However, my urges cloud the mind and you just don't think the way you would normally. In the past, I've driven around and even let women approach my car, but I've never actually went through with it. I was always able to let reason and empathy in to convince me not to do it and just go home. However, on this night, I had a strong buzz and I smoked a joint when I got back to my car. I was already feeling good from a couple of drinks, but after the joint, I fell into a trance. I would do it. Tonight is the night. If given the opportunity, I'm going to pay for sex. I drove around for a couple of hours and easily saw three or four women who eagerly try to catch your eye as you drive past them, looking for a head nod or a quick flash of lights to signal that you know the deal and want to go. Like the other nights, I couldn't bring myself to do it, partly because the women out were aggressively marching down the street. They looked sad, agitated, in a hurry, dirty. I was already nervous, and the image I was playing in my head on how this would all go down was not like this. Deep down, I know there was some shame, and these women looked like they were going through it. So, just like other nights, empathy and shame convinced me to go home. On my way, I was far from the Broadway Strip, where you will find what you're looking for. It was easily 3.30am, and I was approaching a four-way stop sign in a completely different town. 
when I saw a young woman standing by the stop sign. This area is very different than the strip. On the strip, it's very busy, and it's nearly impossible not to be seen. Here, it was dark and not a car in sight. She was wearing a club-style dress. She looked nothing like other women I'd seen. She was younger, looked closer to my age, and was just standing there. I pulled up to the stop sign, not knowing if she was a prostitute or not. I tried to play it cool and casually look her way. She looked back at me and then turned her head. I took this as she's a woman just waiting for a ride or something and started to drive away when I heard, Hey, do you want to hang out? I will admit when I heard her speak, I was taken aback. In seconds, my heart went from a gentle beat to an aggressive quickening drum. I stopped in the middle of a four-way and began to quiver. I grew cold and felt stiff as she approached my car. I looked in all directions, ready to floor it if I saw any headlights. Boom, boom, boom. My heart thumped hard as she couldn't have taken any longer to walk ten feet. When she opened my door, I could see her better. She was really pretty, and in that moment, I thought she wasn't a hooker, but a girl who just gets in random guys' cars. I know it's stupid, but it was my thought at the time. I pulled off and tried to relax. My arms were still stiff and my neck and shoulders were flexed to the point her first words were, Are you okay? I assured her I was, but I was actually losing it. I thought any second now a cop's gonna pull up and arrest me and I'm gonna end up in a paper or some registry and my life is ruined. Any set of lights scared the shit out of me, and I would shrink as I passed. I asked her how her night was, because I could not think of anything else to start off with. She told me she was waiting for a friend, but it's really cold outside, and when she saw me, she thought I could give her a ride. Again, perhaps I was being dumb, but I believed her. I asked where she needed to go, and she told me it was back the way I came. She then said for the ride, she would do me an extra special favor. I'm sure you can all guess what that was. Admittedly, I was more relaxed once I knew the situation I was in. I still didn't know what to say. I just sat back and let her tell me where to go. My thought that this whole experience was actually easy and not weird quickly changed once I realized this woman had some issues. She was talking a lot and about the most random stuff. She had a lisp and could not sit still. It was freaking me out and I wanted to ask her to sit still but I was afraid of her reaction. She was no longer the still, calm woman I saw for a whole ten seconds standing at that stop sign. I got a bad feeling in my gut. She asked me if I had any drugs. I told her I had a half a joint she could have. She looked at me and got annoyed. She wanted heroin, not weed. I told her I don't do that and she interrupted me. She said she could get us some. I refused and kept on asking where I needed to bring her. She would point in some random directions and say I took the wrong turn, or she thought a street was actually another street. After realizing I'm a fucking idiot, and I now have this lady in my car, I no longer wanted what I wanted when I picked her up. I told her I wasn't interested in the special favor she would do to me, and I would bring her to a destination if she would tell me where it is. Anytime I hinted at dropping her off, she would tell me to pull over so she could do to me what she said she would but I would refuse and say I'm good. I kept asking, can I drop you off here? To which she would reply, no baby, please, I'm lost, but I will find the way. Please, I'm so good, you won't regret it. Let's party, you can come in, and we can do whatever you want. I would be lying if every time she dropped a sex reference, I didn't consider it, but her behavior was so fucked up that I would bring myself back to reality and refuse. I was growing impatient and pulled over. I asked her to get out of my car, but she refused. What the fuck did I get myself into, I thought. Like seriously, have any of you listeners actually had to get someone out of your car? A stranger at that, in the middle of the night. She was acting erratic and seemed one touch away from screaming and losing it. I did not want to draw any attention to myself. We were in a neighborhood, and I knew if she screamed, someone would hear and call the cops. I also didn't want to drive far away, because that seemed like a bad idea. I thought this would be an easy transaction, but I was wrong and had an unstable woman reaching for my belt, ignoring all my requests for her to leave my car. 
No, no, no. I told you I'm good. I just want to get you out of my car. She wouldn't respond. She just sat back and grunted, then half whined like a child and rolled her eyes before reaching for my pants again. I said no, please just get out of my car. I will pay you to get out of my car. This got her attention and she asked how much. I told her 20 bucks and she didn't have to do anything. Just get out. She sat there for a minute and said she would, but I needed to drop her off at her house. This was so fucking frustrating. I desperately wanted this night to be over and was trying to patiently guide it to a close, avoiding anything crazier than the situation I was already in. I agreed and we pulled off in the direction we came. We were about 20 minutes from where I originally picked her up and while driving I was getting really scared. I hadn't prepared myself for this. I felt stuck and at the mercy to this woman in my car. While driving I heard a lighter ignite and when I looked over she was smoking a pipe, twirling it in a circle as the flames touched the glass tip. I freaked out and yelled, What are you doing? She just looked at me and exhaled a large amount of smoke. It's hard to describe what it tastes like, but it was not weed. Meth or heroin, perhaps, but I don't really know. I immediately rolled down my windows and noticed that I was approaching the four-way stop sign where I picked her up. I pulled over into an apartment complex and told her to get the fuck out of my car. She looked at me and said, Hold on, hold on. I need to call my friend. I forget what building he's in. I thought, no fucking way. I was not going to sit here and wait for a guy to come out and probably rob me. Get out, get out, get out of the fucking car right now. I was losing it. My heart was racing and I just didn't care anymore. I kept yelling louder and louder until I heard a loud thump sound near my ear on the left side. I jumped and looked to my left. There was a man outside punching my window and pulling at my door handle. I let out a half scream and grunt as I was so scared and confused. I will admit things are a bit fuzzy from here on. My adrenaline was through the roof and I only remember bits and pieces of what happened next. I remember looking over at the woman and she was trying to unlock the passenger door probably to let the guy in. I'm pretty sure she got it open, but I threw the car in reverse and hit the gas. Thank God there were no cars behind me because I was not looking as I reversed. I remember the woman trying to get out of the car, but I was picking up speed because by then I put it into drive and floored it out of the complex parking lot. It was like we both realized at the same time we were both still in the car. I was going about 45 to 50 miles per hour and slowing down at the same rate my brain was trying to figure out what the fuck do I do next. That's when I heard it. A thud followed by a sort of tearing sound. I felt waves of pressure on my shoulder near my collarbone. When I tilted my head, I realized the woman was stabbing me. I assumed it was a knife, and I thought to myself, I'm dead. I'm fucking dead. I slammed on the brakes and reached for the knife. She was going nuts, screaming and punching at me. One of us must have hit the radio on which connects to my phone, and it was playing a song from a playlist. I had the volume up when I shut it off, so when it turned on, it was blaring. I was listening to an 80s essential playlist, and over the speakers blurred Material Girl by Madonna. I completely stopped my car and sort of blacked out. I remember her screaming bloody murder and clawing at my face. I also remember getting a hold of her arms but this made her thrust her body over the middle console and just shake and squirm. She was a lot stronger than I would have ever expected. A switch must have been flipped because I decided or realized I was fighting back. I gave this woman a clean three-piece and it slowed her momentum down for a second before lunging at me again. I remember thinking, why are you fighting me? I would let her go no problem. I wasn't trying to hurt her. The thought then crossed my mind. I may have to kill her, because even though I wasn't feeling it, I know I'd just been stabbed and was waiting to feel a blade plunge into my chest or stomach. I grabbed her by the throat and started to squeeze, anger flowing from my face to my hands as I gripped tighter. I was yelling, you fucking bitch. Thank the stars I was brought out of that rage quickly, because in a blink of an eye, I realized my anger and let up on my grip. She was coughing and was now trying to leave. 
I unlocked the door and watched her roll out of the car. I sped off with the door still open and raced home. I realized my heart was racing and I had tears running down my face. I pulled over halfway home and inspected myself. I went for my shoulder and to my surprise, I wasn't stabbed with a knife. I was cut, but barely. Looking on the seat, I realized she was stabbing me with a small screwdriver I kept on the side of the door. My shoulder throbbed in pain and I was bleeding from the punctures, but they were not serious. I also found a cell phone and crack pipe. I threw both out of the window. I jumped in the shower and immediately went to bed, shaking the whole time. I was exhausted and when I woke up, my entire shoulder was bruised and so were parts of my chest where she must have also hit me. I was ashamed for a few days and prayed I didn't hurt her. I took full responsibility for that night. I believed it was karma for attempting to take advantage of a sick person. Thankfully, I saw this woman again walking down the strip. I felt a huge sense of relief watching her walk down the road. She looked right at me and didn't flinch. I'm not saying she would have recognized me, but in that moment, she didn't. I can easily say I would never do anything like that again, and for peace of mind, I started seeing a therapist about my urges I feel. It was real embarrassing admitting certain things at first, but it got a lot easier and has helped me practice a stronger, more rational thought process when I desire sex. Back in the early to mid 80s, I had a paper route in a medium-sized southwestern Pennsylvania town. This would have to have happened in either 83 or 84. I was 13 or 14, depending on that year. I was out one night collecting the subscription fees from my customers. It was winter because I remember that the sky was dark. I don't remember there being any snow on the ground, but I was usually done collecting by 6.30 p.m. That was on purpose because the penguins usually came on at around 7 p.m. It was cold and I decided that I wanted a hot chocolate for the walk home. There was a convenience store near my paper route. Even now, at night, the area is fairly busy with crosstown traffic for a dead-end southwestern Pennsylvania town. Well, I'd headed on over to the store and got myself a nice cup of hot chocolate. I paid it. As I was walking out into the parking lot, a guy in a pickup truck with a cap over the bed called me over. I figured, for some reason, that he recognized my paperboy receipt book, and he thought I might know the area. Thirteen-year-old logic, I guess. I supposed he was going to ask me for directions. There was some traffic, and the lot was well lit, so I didn't feel any fear. I headed over to the truck, and there were three occupants. The guy, much older than me, but not as old as my dad, and two cute girls who I recognized were older than me, but I don't know how much older. The guy looks straight at me and says, These girls want a party. Get in. And that's a direct quote. I will never forget it. Now, I'm 13 or 14, pimply as hell, and I weighed about 95 pounds soaking wet, with 20 pounds of sand in my pocket. These two chicks want to party with me. Sure, it doesn't take much for a teen boy to start pitching a tent. But I'd seen a lot of videos in high school. This shit was just screaming stranger danger. I politely declined and started walking towards home. The guy sweetens the, uh, pot, I guess. Hey, she really thinks you're cute and we'd have weed and beer. Just get in and let's go. I again politely decline. This whole time the girls have said nothing. I started walking up the road towards my house, and the guy pulled out of the lot and started following me in his truck. A couple of hundred feet up the road, a railroad bridge with a retaining wall crossed over the road they were on, and on the other side I could go through a very small wooded area and into my neighborhood. I went up the embankment and started crossing the tracks. I could see down onto the road, and the guy was leaning out of his truck window and looking back at me. Well, I kept walking, and I saw him pass the first turn into my neighborhood. Good. I was home free. 
My house was three blocks up from the bottom of the hill, and I ran like fog. I got to the third block, and what comes over the crest of the hill? A pickup. I wasn't moving very quickly or anything, so I easily made it to the front porch of our duplex before it passed. I told my dad about it a couple of days later, and he freaked out. For about a month, he insisted on driving along my paper route until I was done. The first time a guy in a car pulled up alongside me and asked me if he could buy an extra paper off me, my dad pulled up and yelled at him to move along. But I never saw that truck again. So, for some context, I'm a 19-year-old woman and I moved back into my mother's house late last year. I have a 50 or 60-ish male neighbor who I've caught watching me almost every day for the past few months now, maybe since January or February. The way our houses are laid out is a little confusing. My backyard ends on the side of his house and yard, so the front of my house is pointed to the side of his. My room's window faces the ground level, so I have a direct view of the side of his property. What he will do is stand outside when he smokes, and the whole time his body will be facing my direction. When I first started noticing it, I shrugged it off as him looking at the sky or mountains behind my house, or maybe he was zoned out. But after a while, I noticed that he didn't try to look in any other direction when I'm in my room. Soon it was just about every day I could count on seeing him outside, looking into my window. I was getting sick of it. I started by hiding when I would see him, then shutting the blinds on him and opening them up after he left, then staring back at him and then flipping him off. He knew I had noticed. Now he would scurry away behind the corner of his house when I protested. At this point, he knows I've seen him multiple times and that I don't like him. Now, the other day was different. I'd taken the screen out of my window so that my cats could come in and out as they please. One of them has abandonment issues and won't go outside without someone close. So now, seeing me through my window was even easier. My younger brother was in the back working on our garden and I was leaning out of the window chatting with him. I looked up and saw the guy, half hidden behind his house, facing right toward me. My annoyance and anger had reached a breaking point. I yelled at him across both properties to stop staring, and he scurried away behind his little corner. My brother and I continued our conversation as it seemed he got the hint. I was wrong. I kept an eye out for him and that corner. I saw him again. This time just the top of his head and eyes as he concealed his body behind his house and leaned forward as far as he could. My blood ran cold. This guy, who I don't even know, and is three times my age, is so desperate to just look at me that he can't even stop even after being yelled at. I yelled again and he hid again, not saying a word. I was trying to wrap up the conversation between me and my brother so I could shut my window and hide. Once again, I see him, just his head and eyes, staring. I scream this time and then slam my window. He cowered off, but he won't get the hint. I don't know what to do. I like keeping my blinds open during the day since I can keep the cacti in my room that need light. Not to mention the lights in my room don't work, so I have to use sunlight anyway. I shouldn't have to change my routine because of a creep, but I don't think I can report him to the police because he's staying on his property. I don't know if I can legally record him if he's in his yard. I want to knock on his door and tell his wife, but my mom advised me against that. I don't think me giving him a stern talk will do anything other than fuel whatever fantasies he might have of me. It could be dangerous too. This situation is starting to affect my mental health. I'll wake up in the middle of the night convinced someone is right outside looking at me. I can't even change my clothes in my own room anymore because I feel like he's already caught a peek.
Not too long after, he was outside shirtless, smoking a cigarette. He could tell I saw him. He scurried away and then came back. I grabbed my phone, opened up Snapchat, and started recording. I just screamed at him and threatened to call the cops, and he argued back. I called my mom and I told her I was calling the cops. She told me she would come home and talk to me about it before we do. She was brief. My mom called me again before I left to my friends and allowed me to explain the situation further. I guess she thought I was outside when this happened, which is why she wasn't urgent. She's told me to stay home and to get the house ready for the police, and gave me the green light to call them. So, I called the cops. An officer came over, and I showed him from my room where the neighbor stands outside. Basically, he told me to get a curtain, and that since he's on his property, he's technically allowed to stand and look in any direction he wants. And it's just unfortunate my window is easy to see into. He can't tell him not to face my house when he smokes outside. I ask the officer to suggest he smokes on the other side of his house or on the front porch. He said he would talk to him, but not to expect much to happen. I told the officer I felt it was an invasion of privacy and that it's been occurring for months. That I should be able to live in my room and not be watched. Basically... I guess he has the right to look into my room as long as he is in his yard and I can't do anything about it legally unless there is solid evidence of intention. I also found out my mom shut off the cameras because it was blowing up her phone too much. If I had a recording of yesterday where he peeked around the corner, I could have proved intent. I guess I'm out of luck. Hello, I am a married woman and my husband and I have two children, Isaac from my first marriage and Tiana with my now husband. I am very distraught right now because I've been seeing this woman almost everywhere I go. I have no idea if this is happening by coincidence. I'm trying to be calm as I tell you this. This whole situation started somewhere around May 2022, where me and Isaac were at the local park just doing our own thing. My son was just playing with some children at the monkey bars when I saw this woman approach me. She had red hair and her face seemed tear-stained. I became concerned as I thought she was crying. I proceeded to ask her what was wrong, if she was alright, but she kept staring at my son. The more she looked at him, the more she sobbed. Then, all of a sudden, she sprints to him, running, screaming, Michael. She kept calling him that and it freaked me out. I mean, she was running to my kid and calling him a different name. My son and the other child got scared off. I approached them before she did as I was faster than her. I then screamed at her to get lost but she just stood there as I held my son. She seemed pretty enraged. She then muttered some things but I could not hear her as she stomped away. The other child's father and I talked for a bit and he also seemed alarmed by what happened. He predicted that she was probably a grieving mother and that my son looked like the child she lost. I was still disturbed and took my son home. Since then, I've been afraid to take any of my children to any public areas despite my husband's reassurance. Skip to June 2nd, 2022. I get a call from my school stating that a woman who was a new volunteer for lunch duty kept saying to my son, hey Mikey Bear, and that she's been looking for him for years. They told me that another volunteer who'd been working with her reported this. I was scared as hell, and I acted immediately by signing my kids out for the day. When I called the school the next day, I was informed she was no longer there, so I became pretty freaked out. Skip to last week, July 13th, 2022. It was Tiana's fifth birthday, and we decided to host it at a park in my in-law's hometown. Everything went well, although I was paranoid. 
It was then, somewhere around 9pm, when we began tidying up, and as I looked at the many oak trees behind, I could have sworn I saw her. I screamed at the top of my lungs and started chasing after her, but she somehow got away. Ever since then, I've not seen her, but I feel like this is not the end of it. I decided to call my parents and the police. The school said they would give the woman's information to the police if they asked for it. The police were somewhat helpful. They were there from 6pm to 8pm. We told them all about the incident with the woman, and thankfully they were later able to get the information about her from the school. I know the information she gave the school could have been possibly fake but that's still not confirmed yet. The police did say that they were going to interview the woman who was volunteering alongside her, as well as the children and teacher in my son's classroom. A police report has been filed though, and I've had some people say she could be associated with my deceased ex. My son does look awfully like his dad. I'm scared as hell right now. She could be a crazy ex or family member, but I've only known her through this situation. That's it. I don't fucking know. I was a very talkative child. I loved chatting and making friends in the park, in the mall, wherever I would go really. Every week, we would go to various grocery stores to go and buy the stuff that we need. May it be cooking oil or baby powder. We always did shopping on a weekly basis. I always seem to unexpectedly remember this vivid memory of one Sunday. It was in a grocery store about three kilometers away from home. I was a toddler then, so I was pretty helpless even though I knew how to speak short words by then. Mind you, this was in a grocery store in the middle of the day. A lot of people thought of me as extremely adorable, mostly because of my plump figure as a kid. I was holding my mom's hand and we were walking through the aisles. When she got all that we needed, we walked to the checkout. My mom was busy, so I took a brief look around and was observing the place. I was walking, smiling at people, waving at some kids. And then, this woman approached me. She was some sort of employee for a baby milk brand and was searching for some new talent that they could use in their upcoming commercial. She looked down on me, and I immediately felt cold. She had the eeriest fake smile, and wore pink, violet clothes. She had a lavalier microphone on, but it was turned off. She was talking to my mom about maybe considering me as a baby milk model for their commercial. My mom politely said that she wasn't interested, but the woman did not take it lightly. All of a sudden, she grabbed on my arm and tugged on it like I was some sort of ragdoll. At this point, my heart was beating rapidly. Who is this woman? Why is she doing this? Why isn't anyone stopping her? These were the questions running through my mind as she heaved me aggressively. My mom was quick to respond and everything went slow. They were both pulling on my arms. My mom on the left and the woman on the right. The woman would just not give up. She pulled harder and it caused me intense pain on my right shoulder. I started crying. I was panicking on the inside. I was wondering if this woman would tear me to pieces. As a kid, this was all I knew to think. I will forever be grateful to my mother because of this. She screamed and called out to the people just watching, which alerted the security. The guard came and removed the woman's grasp from my arm. I felt relief as I hugged my mom tightly. The security guard escorted the girl to the employee's lounge while my mom filed a report to their office. We then met up with my aunt and dad and I was treated to some dim sum right after. So when I was little, I was involved in something called Safety City. It's basically a program for kids that teaches you about safety during fires and shows you what different things mean like stop signs and such. It's actually really fun for kids that age. After completing a task or answering a question right, you get a sticker or a badge 
and everyone got to wear police caps. Well, one afternoon, after Safety City, I was outside playing with charcoal or something else a five-year-old would be doing alone on the driveway. A white van drove by slowly and stopped in front of our basketball hoop. A man and a woman, my parents' age probably, got out of the van and said hello to me. They started speaking to me like they'd known me since I was born. In fact, I think the lady said she remembered I was a very pretty baby and had a pretty shaped head, whatever that means. After answering some mundane questions they had for me, the lady told me she had puppies in the van. Of course my ears perked right up and I stood up and said, Really? And then the man chimed in, Yeah, would you like to pet them? Without another thought, I grabbed the lady's outstretched hand and followed her to the van. I really wanted a damn puppy. I was five, so I was very stupid. She slid the door open and helped me hop up into a seat and then slammed the door shut. There were no puppies. And I mean, I got up and searched the entire back seat and the seats behind me. They both had gotten into the van and ordered me to sit down. They started driving, and at this point, I began to panic. We had just talked about getting into strangers' vehicles in Safety City earlier that day, and I had wandered right into their trap. After driving for what seemed like an hour, but was actually probably a few minutes, we landed in front of my house again. They opened the van door and let me hop out. I ran to my mom and dad, who were standing on the driveway. I was sobbing and couldn't make out half of what they were saying to me. At this point, I noticed Officer Meathead standing on the opposite side of my dad. He was the teacher of my Safety City class. He explained to me that this was a test and I'd failed miserably. The two people in the van were actually two of my parents' good friends, who I just didn't remember. Long story short, this entire thing was a sick test to teach me to never get into cars with strangers. Ever. From that day on, I was always on guard for vans, even if it was a neighbor that I knew very well. I basically gave them the fuck you sign when they drove by, and then I would run into the house. I will never forget my dad picking me up, almost in tears, saying to me, Sissy, you cannot ever get into a car with a stranger. If a stranger approaches you, you scream bloody murder for daddy, okay? It might be worth mentioning that I live in a really small town in Ohio where everyone knows everyone, so pretty much everyone's child went through this test if they took a safety city class. This is the first time something like this has ever happened and I can't get it out of my mind. I went grocery shopping with my half-sister today. Everything was normal until midway into shopping. I was in the end of the juice aisle and my half-sister needed to use the restroom. I looked up at her as she ran off to the bathroom and as I watched her go, I noticed this older man, probably late thirties, standing in line waiting to pay. He was looking at me directly. I didn't think anything of it. I just thought he was looking around because he was in a long line. I looked down into my cart and looked up again, and he was still staring at me. I didn't think much of it. I started pushing my cart to get one more thing while my sister was in the bathroom. I left the aisle, took a left, and passed him directly. We locked eyes, and I just gave him a half-second smile, kinda like, what the fuck are you looking at, dude? Before I turned into another aisle, I turned around to see if he was still looking, and to my surprise, he was walking toward me, still staring at me. I was confused because he was just in line to pay, so I turned into the aisle, becoming hyper aware and a bit suspicious. I'm in the new aisle, and I walk through. I turn once more around, and there he is. He's now in the same aisle, walking my way, staring at me still. He's far from me. But something is wrong. I said to myself, I think I have a stalker. I kept going. At this point, I was in a bit of fight or flight, trying to lose him. I take a left and keep walking. I turn around, and he's now out of the aisle, coming towards me again. I take another turn into the frozen ice cream aisle, and as I walk through it, 
I turned around, and lo and behold, he's right there, turning into the aisle, still following me. I stopped and stared at him, like, what the fuck? My heart started to pound, and I honestly felt so helpless and scared, even though there were people everywhere. I started walking really fast into another aisle, and I found a spot to hide. I stood in front of water bottles for a few seconds, and ran to the produce department where I could find a worker, in case I saw him again. I called my sister, and thank god she found me, and she's safe too. Please tell me what the fuck that was. I hope to god he was gone, and did not see what car I was driving when I left. This happened to me during the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016 until I moved due to the fear of living alone in my apartment. For a bit of backstory, I'm a 22 year old British female. I'd been living in Japan since April 2015. The apartment I first lived in was rented out by a company connected to my school. It was not a good apartment at all, but at the time I didn't know what the general quality and size versus price of Japanese apartments were. I was given one of five that I chose before I moved in. The apartment was seriously tiny. It was one room, the kitchen was connected, and the bed was about two steps away from it. The length of my whole apartment was about ten steps, but I was excited because it was my first time living alone, and it was in a country I'd only previously dreamt about living in. After about a month of living and studying in Japan, I met my ex-boyfriend. He told me that the area I lived in was not a good one, and it was known for inhabiting creepy people. He warned me not to walk alone at night anymore, or if I did, then I shouldn't wear headphones and to be very wary. Now that's done, I'll get into the story. I'd been living there for six months when my best friend returned to England and moved out. This left me a bit scared, because I had noticed previously that the neighbor on my left was a bit odd. He would constantly clear his throat as if he was coughing up a fucking hairball or something. He didn't live immediately next to me, but down the hall. So when I exited my room and looked left, his door was in my view. On the left were stone stairs going up to nothing, and if you went past the stairs, you'd be standing outside his door. And on the left is more hallway and stairs going down. I only took these stairs to do my washing. Otherwise, I always used the stairs on my right at the end of the hall, because the stairs leading to the washing machines were always full of spiders. Fuck that. So my friend moved out, and after that, I noticed this guy a lot more. At this point, I'd never seen his face, but I knew when he was in or out of his place in the evenings, due to the light that would yellow his peephole if it was on. He still cleared his throat all the time, and despite having space between us, it was loud enough to sound like it was coming from outside my door. That's how loud he did it. To be fair, our walls were crazy thin. I didn't think much of him until I started noticing that when I went outside my door to smoke, his light would suddenly turn off. I didn't think too deeply about it since I would usually go out at night. Maybe he just decided to go to bed and I coincidentally saw it. Every time. Anyway. One day, I went out for a cigarette and saw his peephole go black. I stared at it while I smoked, trying to pick up on any changes in the light to confirm or disprove my theory that he hadn't turned off the light and that it was in fact blacked out by his own face. I was stood up this time for some reason. I usually sat down, but I had a weird feeling this day and stayed standing. I forgot to mention that our doors are metal so opening them and closing them make really loud noises. I stubbed out my cigarette and put it in my ashtray when I noticed him open his door and start coming out. I was on high alert, so I was a bit panicked, but I thought to myself, he's probably just taking out his trash or something. Then I went cold as I noticed he wasn't holding anything at all. He just stood there facing me. I turned as slowly and naturally as possible to go into my apartment as he started walking. He went past the hall to the stairs and towards my apartment. The path was straight, so if he intended on walking past me, he'd have to keep his feet straight, but he didn't. 
His walk was angled towards me, and the space between our doors was less than three meters. I opened my door, and he suddenly started to walk much faster. I got round my door and entered, closing it, and just had enough time to see him lurch towards my door as I slammed it shut and locked it. He stopped outside. I couldn't see him because of my broken peephole. I didn't hear him keep going past my door or going back to his, so I knew he was right there, right on the other side. As I was listening intently, I saw my handle very slightly jiggle. He was trying to open my door with fuck knows what intentions. I waited for maybe 30 seconds before I heard him finally turn back and walk back to his place, and then I heard a door shut. I was extremely panicked at this point, so I called my male school friend and explained everything. He asked if I wanted him to come over, but he lived pretty far from me and it was already late. I told him I'd be okay, and he stayed on the phone with me for a while as I calmed down. During our conversation, he asked me to open my door and close it to see if the guy would come out again. I did, opening and closing it hard, listening intently. And to no surprise, I heard his door open and close again after he probably paused and stared, wondering why he'd heard my door but not seen me. After this, I was so scared to be in my apartment at night or go out for cigarettes. I started testing it. I'd leave my room silently, smoke, then close my door normally after I was done and listen. Sure enough, every time I closed mine, I'd hear his door open. I would occasionally hear him come to my door and just stand there. One night I was out smoking and the creep came home as I was there. I froze still, staring at him from the corner of my eye. He didn't even open his door at first. He just stood there staring at it for way longer than normal. Another thing that I cannot 100% say was him, but I am pretty sure it was, is that sometimes I would smoke in the stairwell when it was raining because the rain would hit me when I stood outside my door. I smoked and put my cigarette in my ashtray. It was kind of smelly, so I left it there on the stairwell. I always left it on the third step, the same one I habitually sat on when I smoked there. I left it there tucked in the corner by the wall and went inside. I closed my door normally and went to bed. I knew the people that lived on my right, one to three doors down. We all used the second stairwell when we went out and I know for a fact that they don't smoke. On the left of my creepy neighbor's room was a Chinese couple that I didn't know. They, and the creep, always used the stairs that led down to the washing machines. The stairs I was sat on, as I said before, are not used because they go up to nothing, and they aren't even visible unless you walk around the corner. Anyway, I go back the next morning to get my ashtray, and not only was it a couple of steps up and in the middle, there was a cigarette butt and a scrunched up packet of cigarettes, the same brand that I smoke. I don't know if it was him, but that stairwell is only easily visible to us. This was all happening over the months of 2015 and the beginning of 2016. The thing that convinced me to finally move out was the following. I'd been out for dinner with my boyfriend and we got back after 11pm. To enter the gate at my apartment after 11pm, you need a key as they lock it. I was walking faster than my boyfriend, turned a corner leading to my apartment, and saw a figure stood in the darkness near the gate, waiting and watching me approach. He started to appear from the shadows, away from the apartment and toward me. My boyfriend turned the corner, and as soon as this guy noticed him, he pulled his phone out and quite clearly pretended to talk to someone on it. My boyfriend and I walked past and he slowly followed. I didn't realize at this point that it was my creepy neighbor, but we were silent, both wary of the situation. As I got to the gate, I noticed that it was locked and started searching my bag for my keys. The guy came up, said excuse me, and nonchalantly opened the gate and stood on the other side. I'd found my keys by this point and he was holding his ready to lock the gate again. But the guy was stood as if he was waiting to see if my boyfriend would enter with me or not. I showed him my keys, said thank you, and that I locked the gate. He reluctantly left me before my boyfriend had come in, and we watched him go up the stairs, but we didn't see which apartment he went to. 
When I saw I'd used the washing machine stairs, it clicked that it was my creepy neighbor, and I told my boyfriend. We went up the same stairs slowly. I went first and peered around the corner to where my neighbor lived. He was stood there, waiting, staring at his door, but not opening it. He noticed me come around and turned to me, staring at me until he saw my boyfriend, and then he went inside abruptly. This was the last incident I could handle. I knew he was up to something no good, and I didn't want to wait for anything else to happen, so I decided after that to cancel my contract and move out. Until the day I moved, he still did creepy things. I'd hear him outside my door, or see the black people, and I knew he was staring at me. Let me start this off by letting you know that I was living close to a metropolitan area for a little over a year before moving back to my tiny hometown. Before that, I was at college, other places, and stuff like that. I didn't interact with anyone from my hometown besides family for many years. I even deactivated my Facebook for a few years. Anyway, fast forward to fall of 2020, I moved into a house in this tiny town. One chilly fall night, I decided it was the perfect night to chill and get inebriated off many glasses of wine. I was relaxing on the couch with my girlfriend when we suddenly heard someone knock on the front door. It was around midnight, so she immediately told me not to answer the door. I immediately got up to pull up the blinds on the glass portion of the door to see a meek-looking girl, probably younger than 20, standing on her porch with a blanket in a bag. I was shook by this because in a town like this, there are no homeless people. The town is so small, people usually have a support network when things go sour. I asked her what was going on, and she said she was homeless and needed a place to stay. My drunk self thought it was an amazing time to fulfill my need of helping the world by opening my front door to let her stay in the guest room. My girlfriend immediately sat her down and was asking her questions, but looking back, her answers were pretty vague. Eventually she told us she knocked on every door down the street to find a place to stay because she got into a fight with her mom, so she wasn't homeless. It is also odd to think a young girl would do that, considering the danger. Eventually I find out that she went to the same private school that I went to, from 1st to 6th grade, except the college extension of the same campus. We were kind of bounding on shit-talking the campus because it's this new age bullshit school run by boomers. But then she mentioned that she had a no contact order for sitting at the same table as someone at the school. My drunk self did not register, no contact meant, restraining order. So, we're talking and then she says that she recognizes me from Facebook. I was alarmed, especially because I've never seen this girl before in my life. We have an almost 10 year age gap. She told me it was because I posted a local rental on the Facebook home share. Okay, that's reasonable. Small town. But then she tells me that she knows my mom. This is alarming because my mom and I have different last names, and she doesn't have any social media or any way to connect us. That was another thing my drunk self registered only the next morning. Fast forward to the morning. She says she's going to leave, and I ask her if she wants a ride because it's cold out. As I drive down the street several miles, I realize she does live on the same street, but she also would have to pass at least five developments and many rows of houses to get to my house. Was I really the only one to answer the door, or did she target my house? The next day, my girlfriend and I both discussed how odd that was and how many things didn't add up. Later in the day, we come back home from the store and we see the girl in front of our house, again, I'm panicking because I'm horrible with confrontation, and my girlfriend said, You let her into the house. You deal with it. My girlfriend stays in the car, and I ask the girl what's going on. She asks again if she can stay with us. I panicked and asked my girlfriend to get out of the car. My girlfriend told her that she didn't know if she had a gun or who she was, that she could only stay with us if she opened up to us about everything and why she's not going home. We sat her down in the kitchen and nicely grilled her, 
only to get vague answers. To be honest, initially I was concerned it was an abuse situation, but it turns out it wasn't. At this point, she's in our house, and we don't know how to get her out. By a stroke of luck, she says she's leaving to go to the dining hall, and we'll come back later. We quickly tapped signs on both the front and the back door that read, Landlord won't allow additional tenants. Best to go back to your mom's. It's later in the evening and dark out at this point, and we hear banging on the front door, then we hear banging on the side door, and then the back. Finally it stops. We were upstairs and we knew it was her, so we just waited it out an hour. I walked downstairs to check because we were starving and we wanted to use the kitchen. I decided to take one finger and slide one blind shade up from another to peek through the kitchen glass doors. She's standing there facing me in the pitch black on my back deck. She was there the entire hour. I looked her dead in the eye and then turned around and went upstairs. Time passed and she eventually left. When I opened the door, we noticed she took the handwritten notes. As the next day rolls by, everybody's mom and cousin is lecturing and laughing at me about opening my door to a stranger, which to be honest, I would never normally do, but the whole thing wasn't sitting well with me and I needed more information. I posted something on Facebook about it and a boy I went to elementary with messaged me, asking if it was Christine, because she had an obsession with him that led to a restraining order. He advised me that she's probably harmless and not to respond to her. She hasn't come back since. I still have no clue why she truly showed up, or how she knew me. It cost me the purchase of a ring security system, but it could have been worse. This happened around three years ago when I was in my first year of university. I was living with two other roommates. I was walking home from the station only 15 minutes from our house and it was only 9pm. It wasn't too late but the area was pretty suburban and didn't have a lot of street light. There were a couple of people that came out of the station with me but as I walked I noticed it was only one guy who was jogging. I didn't think anything of it as I was used to walking that road but then he starts acting kind of weird. Like instead of crossing the road on the stoplights, he would just jump the rails even though there were cars passing, and he would change his pace a lot. This whole time he was in front of me, so I was kind of keeping an eye already. Then he stopped by a bench to tie his shoelaces, so I ended up walking past him. All of a sudden he runs up behind me, hits me in the head and takes my hat. He continues jogging, and I guess I was so shocked, I just stood there frozen. Then all of a sudden he turns around and starts jogging towards me again, so I ran for it into my nearest gas station. I told the guy behind the counter and he offered to get me an Uber home. I of course told my roommates so we could be more careful and vigilant. Then, not even a week later, I was walking home and noticed another man looking at me and following me in the same area. So I ran for the gas station again. But before calling an Uber, I saw the man waiting outside. Underneath his hood, it was the same guy. I called an Uber but had it take me to my school instead, in case he found out where I lived. I was way too paranoid. It got me and my roommates to get the hell out of that house. A few months later, I found out from a friend that there was actually a series of murders happening in that same time and area for Asian girls. It shook me because I'm Asian. This was many years back when I was still a young teen and around 14 years old. I remember being done with homework and playing on the Nintendo 64 in the living room. I lived in a small apartment which was technically a refurbished basement of the building. The front door started the living room where the TV is located. The TV faced inwards so that meant I would be facing the door at all times whenever playing games. Anyway, when the front door moved, I noticed immediately. I muted the TV and crept towards the door, positioning myself right in front of it. 
The door started inching itself open, as if someone tried to push it open slowly. After a few seconds, I slammed the door and locked it. I heard a small rustling noise and some jingling sounds. It sounded like either a dog shaking itself dry with some chains hitting each other, or a person shaking a bag full of keys. I was ready to push back with all my 14-year-old might. Luckily, whoever was at the other end of the door stomped upstairs and out the apartment main entrance. I don't know who that was or what they wanted, but I'm glad they didn't try to break in again. I feel quite lucky that nothing else came out of that, but it's still unnerving to think about it. I live in a small town in Denmark with a population of roughly 3,000 people where nothing ever really happens, and the following scared the entire town to death. Back in 2005, or when I was still in kindergarten, a strange and agitated man who was a father to one of the children came and demanded my teacher that he wanted to see his daughter and take her out of school. My teacher could see in his eyes that something was not right and that he was extremely upset. He therefore denied him to see his daughter, and after a very uncomfortable discussion, the father eventually gave up. He walked to his car without looking back and drove home. My teacher grew very worried and decided to call the local police to go check on the family's house. Later that day, it was reported on the news that the father had murdered his own wife with a gun, and after that, he ended himself. At the time, my best friend lived next door to the family, and he has since told me that he could hear the mother screaming in a very horrifying way, followed by three shots, and then a grown man crying his heart out. Ten seconds of silence, and then finally, one more shot. It creeps me out just to think about this, and I feel so sorry for the daughter who was left an orphan at such an early stage in life. I really don't know what would have happened to the daughter if my teacher had not stopped the man taking her home with him. I hope you're having a decent life wherever you are, girl. This happened when I was three to four years old. It's probably my second childhood memory and the most vivid to this day. Anyway, we lived in a ground floor apartment suite that faced the front of the building property, right beside the entrance. In this area there was grass and trees and enough space for kids to run around and play. I was standing looking out the patio window and I saw a little boy and two girls playing out front. Suddenly this big burly man with a shaggy long beard runs up and grabs the two girls. The boy is kicking and screaming, telling the man to let them go and also calling for his mom. The man got the boy away from him and took off with the two girls. The boy ran back into the apartment. For years I brought this up to my parents, hoping they could give me some context or remember anything that happened. They'd basically tell me I'd probably dreamt it and it's not real. Last year I mentioned it to my mother and she says, oh yeah, they were siblings and that was their dad. He and the mother were going through a lengthy custody battle and he tried to kidnap the twin girls. She actually said she never wanted to admit I actually saw what I saw, as to not scare me. Okay, Mom, I've spent my entire life having this memory, knowing it was real, and being told it was not. So thanks for the validation, I guess. The girls were returned to their mother, and I assume the father probably lost custody. This happened a year ago, but I still think about it. Me and my friends had the munchies and wanted to go to Taco Bell at 2am, so we took my mom's car and went on our journey. On our way home though, my friends took a wrong turn and ended up in a cul-de-sac. As we were turning around, a resident on the street gets into his truck and starts pulling out right in front of our car. Us, thinking he's going out somewhere, waits for him to go, but he just sits there for a second before getting out and coming toward the driver's side. He walks up to my friend driving and starts yelling at her to slow down, 
that she's going too fast down the street, this and that, and then he started banging on my friend's window and tried opening the door. I can see him doing this, so I tell my friend to drive because I don't want to be sitting there anymore. She pulls the fuck off and he jumps in his car behind us. Halfway out of the street, I noticed he was following us. I stuck my entire upper half out the window and yelled at him. At this point, he's chasing us while I'm giving my friend's directions back to my house. All of our phones are dead or at 1%. He ends up in front of us and cornered us in another cul-de-sac up the street. My friend is driving in people's lawns to get away. Eventually, he followed us all the way to my home. My friends ran inside to tell my mom. I run straight for the car, yelling at him. He asked me what I yelled out of the car, and I said to his face, You fucking baby-ass bitch. He gets upset and almost gets out of the car when he sees my mom come out of the house. He tries leaving, so I stood behind his truck, shouting out his license plate numbers. She makes it to him, and his entire demeanor changes, acting like he's the innocent one, like he was scared. I was told to go inside, and my mom obviously gives him some words of wisdom. She tells me he followed us home because someone ran over his dog a while back, because they were speeding through his street. But it still gives no excuse to follow teenage girls home. Everyone knows what doing laundry is like monotonous work while your brain tries to waste away the minutes it takes for the machine to finish its cycle, occasionally having stiff conversations and passing with strangers. This night was no different, at first. As I pulled my laundry out of the dryer and began to fold it on the table, I heard a voice over the lull of my headphones. Excuse me, are you using this? The voice came from a man in his late 40s to early 50s. He wore glasses that reminded me of my grandfather. He was wearing a stained disposable face mask. It hung under his nose and just above his mouth. I could see the start of a dirty blonde mustache poking out. He was gesturing to an empty cart next to the table. I simply said, No, I'm good. I have one already. And he took it and began loading his laundry and folding it on the table adjacent from mine. Now started the usual routine questions that all lonely older men seem to ask. What's your name? Amy. Ah, that's beautiful. So how old are you? 22. Do you live around here? Not really. The town over. I lied. Did you go to college? What did you study? Yes. Culinary arts management. Oh, so you like to cook? He asked. Yeah, I responded. I tried to keep the conversation short but lighthearted. As it continued with some short remarks about the wonders of doing laundry, he asked the dreaded questions. Where do you work? Do you live by yourself? I hesitated on the questions momentarily, trying to keep my privacy intact without provocation. Oh, you wouldn't know it. It's a small mom and pop restaurant. And no, I don't live on my own. I lied to him. He stopped folding his laundry as I started to load mine into my hamper. He walked over to my table and leaned against the washer so that he was in my eyesight. His eyes squinted slightly as he pulled his mask under his chin, uncovering his face. He then awkwardly called out, So do you want to go to the movies with me sometime, cutie? His eyebrows knitted together softly as a wave of different emotions flooded my brain. Confusion? As to why he'd even ask, I didn't even know his name. Embarrassment, as he's easily my father's age, and I'm not into that. Shock, because this man doesn't even know what my face looks like. Anxiety, because I have to reject him. I was so thankful for my mask, because I'm sure my expression was not one he would have liked to see. I softly shook my head, and he copied my actions in tandem. I fumbled out a soft, no, I'm sorry, I have a boyfriend. I studied his face as I watched his brain process my response. He knitted his eyebrows together and curled his lips. I could see nicotine stains on his teeth. He replied in an eerily soft tone, kind of like how you calm a fussy baby. Oh, no, you don't want to go see the movies. You have a boyfriend. Okay. 
he nodded his head with the last word. His eyes widened slightly as they fixated on mine. His voice suddenly grew cold. It's okay. You don't have to lie to me. It's okay. You don't have to lie to me. Enunciating both don'ts with tinges of anger. Annoyance filled me at his accusation. I'm not lying. We've been together for a year and a half. I love him. His eyes softened as if he just now realized the other two people in the laundromat. He slinked away, returning to his laundry long abandoned. I looked at him as I pulled my hamper into my arms, and I uttered a small, have a nice day. I haven't been back to that specific laundromat, and I don't do laundry alone anymore. I was leaving the gym the other afternoon and I was awkwardly exiting behind a middle-aged man. He was pretty well-dressed to be exiting a gym. He held the door open for me, but then he began keeping pace with me when I headed toward the direction my car was parked in. He began talking to me, just politely at first, and I realized he had a strong accent. It was kind of European. He quickly changed the conversation from normal small talk to asking me if I was single. I quickly said no and tried to speed up. He kept pace with me. He seemed a little upset by this and moved closer to my side as we walked through the parking lot. Would you leave him for me? You're beautiful. I could take good care of you. I know I made a face because he grinned like he knew I was uncomfortable and he was excited by it. I'm in a happy relationship, I deadpanned. Seeing that my car was just four more space down, I considered running for it. There was no one else in the parking lot but us. Would you give me your number? He had already started taking out his phone. I'll text you so you'll have mine, in case you change your mind. No thank you, I quickly said. If you'll excuse me. I sped up again, and thankfully he stopped at the car one space before where I was parked. I half jogged to my car, risking a glance back toward him. He was watching me intently. My gut told me he was waiting to figure out which car was mine. As I unlocked the door, I saw him start to speed walk toward me. Sped up by fear, I jumped into my car and immediately locked the doors. I quickly turned my key and threw my car into reverse as he reached my door. Without even checking what was behind me, I hit the gas and pulled out of the space. I saw him pull his phone back out and seemingly take a picture as I accelerated by him. I was shaking with fear as I pulled out of the parking lot. I had no pepper spray and no weapon on me. I don't know what he would have done if he'd had reached me before I could lock my car. I'm afraid he got a picture of my license plate or something. Was it a trafficking attempt or just a creep? Either way, I won't be going back to that gym. In December 2018, my ex and I split up after 7 years in a relationship. I was new to the dating game, so I didn't want to just jump back into it. In February, I met a guy at a bar we regular. The second time I met him, we exchanged numbers. By the end of March, I was feeling pretty comfortable with him and invited him to a party at my house. He stayed after the party and one thing led to another. Well, after it was all said and done, I had a weird vibe. He was too pushy and it made me uncomfortable, so I asked him to leave. I planned to never speak to him again. That is until he started to text me from random numbers. He would say things like, Hope you have fun fishing, when I didn't post anything on social media that I was fishing. He also said, I hope the movie was good, when I hadn't posted anything online that I was at the movies. He would text me and ask me where in the bar I was at at different bars, when I hadn't told anyone or posted where I was going. We had no mutual friends, so he was following me. The final straw was when my friends took me to Washington DC for my 25th birthday celebration. We bar hopped all over the city. Around 2.30am, 
we came out of the last bar we were at and decided to get cookies across the street. As we were coming out of the cookie shop, guess who pops up? You guessed it, he does. He mentions a few bars and said he wanted to say hi earlier, but being as I hadn't replied to his messages, he didn't want to freak me out. I was terrified. My friend's husband thankfully stepped in and called him out. He threatened to call the police on him. I changed my number and moved. Thankfully, I haven't heard from him since. When I was around six or seven, I had my own room on the other end of the house than my parents. I was a very anxious child with an active imagination. We lived in an old family farmhouse a couple of miles outside of the town my father grew up in. His family lived near us, all within a couple of miles. My aunt had lived in the farmhouse before we did, before I was born, but she moved out after her and her husband divorced. One night, I woke up and saw a man standing in the corner of my room. I ran to my mom and dad's room, screaming. My parents rushed in, and upon seeing nothing, assumed I had a bad dream. I got to sleep with them for the rest of that night. The next night, I woke up and saw the man standing outside my window. Again, I ran to my parents, and again, they saw nothing. This occurred for about two weeks, every single night. Sometimes a man would be in my room. Sometimes he'd be right outside. My parents never believed he was real. Until one night when I awoke to the man standing above me. He was blocking my path to get out of my room, to even get off of my own bed. I was terrified and we stared at each other for a long time in silence before he walked out of my room, straight out of my bedroom door. I finally gained enough courage to race out of my room and wake my parents. By this point, they were tired of the sleepless nights caused by the overactive imagination of their child. I think my dad walked to my room just to comfort me, saying, No one is in your room, honey. It was all just a dream. Except it wasn't. The large muddy boot prints that stained the floor was proof of the man. Eventually, my dad found out my aunt's ex-husband had been released from the psychiatric hospital where he was being treated, and he returned home. He still had a key to the laundry door. My aunt failed to tell us that she did not change the locks. My aunt's ex-husband suffered PTSD from being a prisoner of war while in Vietnam. He self-medicated and fried his brain, though we never knew for sure why he did it. He was found deceased soon after in a riverbed. I don't think he meant me any harm. So I was doing some shopping and was making sure I looked good doing it with my fresh cut and winter clothes fresh pressed. I'd been to a few stores already in a shopping strip when I noticed a girl with a camera was at the exit, waiting for me. I'd seen her already in a store I was previously in. When I passed by her, she acted really weird. She turned her camera away from me, the obvious, take a photo and not look like you did a thing, so I faked her out. I went to go inside one store, then doubled back out the second she stepped in right behind me, but when I started turning around, she bumped into me and straight sniffed me. Immediate what the fuck spurted out. I walked out staring her down. She had a really creepy, horny smile and just bit her fist. Oh my god, what the fuck. I got out of there and went straight to my car, which was in a parking structure. I told security about the girl and she was apprehended. I was flagged to park because the security officer confiscated her camera. Cops were there in a minute since it is a shopping strip. There were tons of photos of me. I didn't press charges, but I demanded all the photos were deleted. She did it all while I fucking me. Today I learned how fucking creepy people can be. I'm a woman and I was leaving my friend's apartment around 10pm to go back to my car. 
It was parked on the street around the corner. I had my 12-pound dog with me and we were walking toward the car. I typically will switch side of the streets I'm walking on to avoid people that look questionable. The life of being a woman, since we always have to be on the alert for that kind of stuff. I'm walking up the empty sidewalk to my car, and a questionable-looking man starts crossing the street. He's walking towards me. There was no reason for him to be crossing the street that I could tell. I had a really bad feeling and decided to turn around and go back to my friend's apartment. As I turn around, I notice he has stepped up the pace and is following me. I call my friend and start yelling. Come downstairs and let me in. There's a guy following me. You have to be let into our apartment lobby by a resident. Me and my dog are sprinting down the street and I keep looking behind me. He starts running behind me to catch up. He's gaining on me and I'm in a full run. My dog is confused but is trying so hard to move her little legs. Luckily my friend was down there waiting for me and let me in. We ran in, shut the door and the guy just walks by as I get the door shut. He starts walking casually like nothing happened and continues on his way. I wait for 30 minutes, shaking and my heart racing. After I calmed down, my friend walked with me to my car this time. I drove her back to her apartment. I have no idea what might have happened, but I've never been so scared for my life. I know this can happen to guys too, but it is sad how every time I'm walking alone, I am constantly on the lookout for being taken, killed, or assaulted. Always trust your instincts, even if nothing happens. It's better to be safe than sorry. Me and my friend had gone to a waffle house around 10pm and there were a lot of people there. My friend kept complaining about how a guy was staring at her, but she is very striking and I just thought the guy was eye-flirting with her. Finally, I turn around and look, and chills run down my spine. Absolutely dead eyes, and this man is staring right past me, fixated on my best friend. I thought this was weird because I thought he would look at me since I made it very obvious when I looked at him that I was kind of pissed off. And believe me, it was a real stop fucking looking at us look I gave him. My friend is kind of panicking because she's just so creeped out, so I just suggested we check out and leave. He's to the right of the register, and I look at him almost the whole time we were checking out. At one point, I got literally right in front of my friend like I was shielding her because she was so stressed. So when I stood in front of her, he started leaning to the side, looking around me, still staring at her. I was pissed because I hate when men feel entitled to make women uncomfortable. And plus his eyes were so wrong. They were just completely black and terrifying. He really had crazy eyes that were really wide open and he didn't blink for the five minutes I was staring right back at him. We peeked at him through the window on the way out of the parking lot and he was still staring at my friend. It was very creepy and it reminded me to be aware of everything around me and to always trust my own or my friend's intuitions. When we feel something is wrong, I just go ahead and assume something really is wrong, and we need to get the fuck out of there. This just happened this week. I was on vacation with my family, and they were driving me insane after three days. I decided maybe I'll take a look on Bumble and see if there are any cute locals to meet up with for an hour or two. My family would be checking out some museums, which is not at all my interest. My friends at home also thought it would be a funny story to meet up with a local. For reference, I'm a 25-year-old woman. I was with my parents and younger sister for a week. We were in a remote-ish area in a small town out west. We were visiting a lot of national parks, so there weren't a lot of people nearby on the apps. I started swiping and soon came across a guy who was my age and looked cute. He had similar interests to me, so I felt like I'd be down for a meetup with him. We started talking on the app and then eventually moved to Snapchat. He suggested we go to the next town over to see fireworks. I couldn't that night since I had plans with my family 
I was also hesitant about meeting a guy 30 minutes away when I was already put out of my element, and we were in what felt like the middle of nowhere. He knew I was there to do hiking in parks, so he suggested we go for a local hike nearby the next day. For an important side note, I deleted my last name on Snapchat before he added me, so he doesn't know it. I don't know if I had a bad feeling in the back of my mind or what, but I didn't want him knowing much of my information. However, it did show his last name, which is important for later. I had hesitations about going into the woods with a random guy, especially since I'd been around the hiking trails the day before. My cell service was cutting in and out, but the trails were populated and I did want to see more out there. My family was going to go to a museum that day that I had no interest in, so I agreed to meet him the next day. That night, I got a bad feeling. I kept getting nervous about meeting a random bumbleman far from home and in an area I don't know too well. Even though my family knew where I would be, I was feeling uncomfortable and decided maybe I should just google this guy and see what other information I can find out about him. Things like his Instagram or LinkedIn. I wanted to give my family his information while I was gone in case anything happened. I also wanted to verify what I knew about him, like his workplace and alma mater that kind of thing. Well, I type in his first and last name and the town we're in in Google, and I click on the first link. The next thing I know, I'm looking at a registered sex offender profile. His full name, address, photo, description of his offenses. And it was fairly recent. I'm not sure if I can go into detail about his offenses, but I can assure you that had I not Googled this man, Things could have turned out very, very badly for me. Or maybe not. But nonetheless, I'm shook that I almost met up with a registered sex offender. Please make sure to do your due diligence when meeting people off of the internet. I thought a lot about sharing this experience, and I finally decided to tell it. When I was about four, I went to the pharmacy with my mom. Now keep in mind that the area where the store was located was a middle class, peaceful neighborhood. So, as my mother was buying what she needed, an old man entered the store. He was probably in his late sixties or early seventies. I remember that when I was waiting for my mom to finish shopping, I started doing some ballet moves. When the man saw me, he complimented my ballet moves, and he told me he has a niece at home who also takes ballet classes. I remember the man asking if I wanted to go meet his niece and play with her. As the naive child that I was, I said yes. The man told me to follow him. As we almost reach the exit of the store, my mom calls my name. I go to her, leaving the old man behind. I did not realize that it was a dangerous situation until I was older. I asked my mom why she didn't react earlier when she saw the man taking me with him. My mom tells me that she was going to save me, but she wanted to see if I would follow the man. Looking back at this, I realize how lucky I am for my mom and how vicious the incident was. So my mother went to the grocery store yesterday. She was looking over a young woman's shoulder to look in the frozen food freezer. The woman kept looking at my mom like she was trying to remember something. She turned around and told my mom, You look just like my best friend Catherine's mom. She asks my mom what her name is and she says, Carrie. The other woman says, Yes, my friend's mom is named Carrie. Then the other woman asked my mom if she worked at the hospital because she remembered seeing her. My mom said yes, that she was a medical coder. The young woman nodded and said that Carrie knew she was a coder from the hospital. My mother didn't recognize this woman, but thought that she knew me or had seen her at the hospital. However, when my mom asked where this Carrie worked, it was a completely different hospital in a different part of the state. So this other Carrie looks like my mom 
has the same career as my mom, has the same name, and has the same daughter as my mom. Talk about coincidence. Hey guys, I hope you're doing well and enjoyed the video. If you don't mind, hit the like button and subscribe. Drop me a comment and let me know what you thought of the stories. Oh, and don't forget to hit the bell icon to turn on notifications. If you fancy checking out the perks of my Patreon or channel memberships, or want to get involved on social media, all my links are down below. I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel, so a huge thanks to Vampy Debs. Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absent Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, Kay, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Mr. Backwoods, Sarah C, Casey, Sarah, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Lil Smart, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Astara Rain, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you all on the next one.